Our invocation this morning will be uh, delivered by Chaplain Melissa Centino from One Safe Place. Thank you so much for coming down today. We'll uh, say the uh, pledges after the invocation. So before I pray this morning, I would just like to read a, a quick passage from the Word of God. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So let's go to him in prayer. Our most heavenly, great heavenly Father, we honor and glorify your name. You are a creator of heaven and earth, and at the same time, we can call you Father. A Father who loves us, is concerned for us, and compassionate to all of our needs. At this moment, Lord God, our world, our county, our city, this country has been upended by this virus. I ask a special blessing, Lord God, on all our elderly, our young children, and all of our first responders. All those who are at high risk, Lord God, of contracting this illness, you, Father, and only you can bring the healing that we need. Would you look after them, Father, and then use us in a way that will show love and compassion? I also ask you, Father, to protect all our national, state, and city leaders, that you allow them clear direction and decision-making on our behalf as citizens, that you will be at their side while they decide what is best for all of us. Finally, Father, in these difficult moments, in these difficult times, let us look at these things as opportunities to assist those who are in need. We ask you to allow us to shine and to assist those who may be struggling at this time. Let us be the face of love and peace and encouragement. We ask that you go with us the rest of this day, the rest of this month, and the rest of this year. And it's in your holy son's name, our Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. 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 We just to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's the flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Chaplain. We appreciate you being out today. Mr. Manius, agenda announcements. Thank you, Honor. Members of the Court, we have several announcements as it relates to the agenda. The first one is under the County Administrator section, and that is item 8A1. We have a revised court communication, and we'll talk about that revision as we get to it. Also, because of the coronavirus issue, we posted an emergency uh, agenda item yesterday afternoon. Uh, we've done the, the proper notifications with the media, and it, it posted well, well before the one-hour limit. And um, I think that we have included that in, in your uh, packet, or at least up at your up at the dais. Also, want to tell everyone that. Uh, that we are live streaming this meeting in 504C. Because of the recommendations of public health, we ask that everyone here try to space yourself at least six feet apart. It's social distancing. Uh, 504C is right around the corner. It's a large room and it has a, a tele, television in it and we're, we're streaming that into that particular location. Thank you. And one other one other comment, and I was going to bring this up a little bit later, but one of the reasons that we're seeing that we have less people in the audience today, we have provided a memorandum to elected officials and department heads, and we sent that out yesterday. I believe each of you have got a copy of it. As part of that, that memoranda, uh, we've asked those department heads and, and and uh, elected officials, if they did not have anything on the commissioner's court agenda, that they didn't necessarily have to be in the court, but that they could uh, watch it over uh, over the web. And the, these meetings are always streamed 
over TarrantCounty.com, and they're live streamed. So with that, Your Honor, that's all I have at the time. Thank you very much, and I too want to stress, y'all spread out um, if if you you know if you can, and we want to try to stay about six foot apart. So uh, you know, let's let's do that as we go forward. Um, court members, you have before you the minutes of our March tenth meeting. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Um, Commissioner Allen, I believe you have a proclamation. I do. Um, and first off, I want to wish everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day. I see some folks out there wearing green. I've got my green since it's been on. Oh, green socks. <laughs> Those are nice. They even got the little. The shamrocks. The shamrocks. Hey, okay. very good. Um, but this proclamation is in recognition of March being Women's History Month. And so uh, we did not ask for any guests to attend to receive this. I will be reading it into the record. And I had intended to invite everyone out to the Fielder House Museum uh, where the League of Women Voters has a pretty neat exhibit uh, showing the history of women's suffrage and women's history here in Tarrant County. But of course, um, that exhibit is no longer accessible due to folks taking the appropriate precautions, but it, it will be open until well, whatever point it reopens, I believe it will remain open until August when that's um, the recognition of um, the ratification of the 19th Amendment. But I will go ahead and read this into the record. Whereas in February 1981, the first joint congressional, congressional resolution designating the week of March 8th as Women's History Week was passed, and Congress later declared March to be National Women's History Month, designated to recognize the vital role in many accomplishments of women throughout history. And whereas this year's theme, Valiant Women of the Vote, pays homage to the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment ratification, which gave women the right to vote. The theme honors those women who fought to win suffrage rights and for the women who continue to fight for the voting rights of others. And whereas the significance of this month dates to the mid 19th century when on March 8, 1857, a group of women garment workers in New York City stage a protest to demand shorter hours, better pay, and voting rights. These courageous women paved the way for women who continue to champion issues and women's rights. And whereas from the late Ann Richards, former governor of the state of Texas, to legislators, commissioners, mayors, council members, school board members, business leaders, and more, many great women have helped frame the past guide the present and forge ahead to the future of our great state and country. And their accomplishments make our communities that much better. Now therefore be it resolved that we the Commissioner's Court of Tarrant County do hereby proclaim March as Women's History Month in Tarrant County and recognize all women for their accomplishments. Further, we honor and applaud the fortitude and the work of women who aspire to serve others and are not afraid to stand alone or along with others. In witness whereof, we have hereunto set our hands and caused the seal of Tarrant County to be affixed the 17th day of March, 2020. And with that, I move for adoption. I move approval with the observation that today would have been Dion Bagsby's birthday. Yeah. So happy birthday, Dion. Yes. Second. Okay, uh, we have motion and a second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. And Commissioner Brooks, thank you so much for remembering Dion today and, and mentioning her because she was certainly a uh, um, significant influence on this court and, and uh, for many, many years. Court members, you have before you any other announcements at this point in time? Court members, you have before you the consent agenda? No approval. Second. We have a motion to second to approve the consent agenda. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Members of the court, we have five additional items to uh, discuss with you this morning. On the first item, we're requesting that the commissioner's court ratify and extend for 90 days the declaration of local disaster, which was issued by Judge Whitley on March 13th, 2020 regarding the COVID-19. Um, the one change that we had from the one we initially published is that 
we wanted to um, ensure that the, the order itself contained the language that this declaration is for a period of 90 days unless rescinded by the order of the commissioner's court. Move for approval. I second that, and in doing so, I want to thank Judge Whitley for his extraordinary leadership over the past week in guiding us through our response to this crisis. Thanks also go to G.K. Manius and the county administrative staff, to the emergency management office, and to our extraordinary public health department, including its director, Vinny Taneja, who I would submit is the best public health director in the state of Texas. Y'all have all served us well. You have provided much needed information. You have provided an attitude of calmness to reassure the citizens of Tarrant County, that there are adults in charge and that we know what we're doing. So uh, thank you. Thank you. So I would applaud Commissioner Brooks's remarks, and then I have a ton of questions. So when do I ask? I've got a ton of questions <laughs> too. We're we're going to in our briefing area. We're going to have um, a discussion at that okay. point in time, and um, you know. So as as you said, yeah. if you've got questions, please go ahead and jot those things down. Uh, we're down. probably going to be talking, or we may be talking about some of it as we go through uh, the different. Section. So okay. let me ask a, a procedural question. Okay. We have a motion and a second to uh, to adopt this extension. Right. Is If your questions relate to that, then, then we can either take them now. If we want to hold all of this information as it relates to corona and until we get to the briefing and have, have the briefing and talk about this at the same time, your honor, whatever the pleasure is. No, I think that might, be, that might be a good idea because if we decide to change something, Instead of having to go back, why don't we just do that and we'll hold any discussion related to COVID-19 to the to that part on the briefing item. So, though, whoever made whoever made the motion, if you would just simply pull your motion down at this time, I can do that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, let me see, Your Honor. Okay, we can go to item number four. We're requesting that the court approve interim financing for grant year 2019. This is a, a HUD program. It's for tenant-based leasing assistance. Uh, this is for a three-month period. As usual, we, the contracts not, have not been sent to us completely yet by the federal government. Uh, the amount that we're asking is approximately $350,000. The grant will reimburse that to the county once we receive the grant. Move approval. Second, we have a motion and a second, but you have a question. I do, and it's related to the national declaration. Would this be, would this affect this grant um, process and the contracts in any way? Not to, uh, no, I do not believe so. Okay. There's no other questions. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Note, please, that Commissioner. Brooks is not in the room at this point in time. So, Your Honor, we'll defer action on 1, 2, 3, and 14 until, until we uh, get back to the briefing agenda. Do you have a 14? <laughs> no 14. You remember that we, we posted the uh, emergency uh, agenda? No, okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, okay, right. So, yes, there is an issue of 14. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Tidwell. We have one item we're asking the court to uh, receive and follow the Tarrant County financial statements for the period ended November 30th, 2019. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. 
Uh, removed. I'm sorry. I move to receive and file the personnel agenda. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussions? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much for that. And we have a couple additional items. Uh, items two and three are both waiver of terminal benefits. The first is for domestic relations. Ms. Glenn is requesting a waiver of 120 vacation hours. Uh, actually, in the, the individual who departed actually had 400. So we're down to 120, uh, 120 hours being requested effective March the 23rd. We are looking at net savings to the general fund of almost $11,000. Move for approval. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. So our next waiver is from <coughs> JP7. Judge Sanders request, is requesting a waiver of 160 hours. Uh, his justice court manager left uh, county service back in February. That individual, too, started off with 400 hours, and so now we've whittled that down to 160 hours. That's uh, being requested today. That's effective March the 21st, if the court approves it. And with this one, too, we're looking at net savings to the general fund of about $3,900. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. And item four, I'm going to need some direction from Mr. Manius on this one. Mr. Manius, this is agenda is for closed. Do we want to hold it until closed or do we want to move forward? Okay. We'll come back then after close. Okay. Thank you. Purchasing, Mr. Beecham. Good morning. Your Honor, other members of the court, we have four items for your consideration this morning. Our first item is a bid award recommendation for RFP 2020-056, RFP for sputter carbon coder system for trace evidence laboratory in the ME's office. Recommendation for the award to uh, LIACA Microsystems Incorporated in the matter of $27,827. <coughs> Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Item number two is also a bid award recommendation for RFP 2020-057, RFP for wireless digital radiology flat panel detector for the ME's office again. Recommendation be awarded to First Source Incorporated in the amount of $32,850. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Item number three, also a bid award recommendation for bid 2020-086, Signing a contract for cement slurry and cementious slurry products. Recommendation be to award to Martin Marietta Incorporated on a per unit price basis. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Last item, also a bid award recommendation for bid 2020-092. Signing a contract for windshield and auto glass repair and replacement. Recommendation be to award a per unit price uh, basis uh, discount from list price, markup for parts, and hourly labor rate awarding to the primary and secondary vendors as shown in your court communicate. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any appointments today? There being none, then I'll ask for you to approve the claims in the addendum. Move approval of the claims, including the addendum. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the claims, including the addendum. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Briefing items, Mr. Manius. Thank you, Your Honor. We're going to go somewhat out of order, and I'm going to ask that we go to item number B, or item B, <coughs> which is the current emerging health issue. Mr. Mayor, Dr. Mayor, are you ready to make that presentation? I believe we do have a PowerPoint. Yes, sir. Good morning, Your Honor, and members of the court. Good morning, Good Benny. Morning. You missed your kudos this oh. morning. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Rest <laughs> assured that this court appreciates your performance through this course. <clears throat> yes, sir. And let me say uh, it's likewise. I appreciate y'all's leadership. I know we've had a lot of discussions, and we're all going to get through this. So let me just start uh, with a situational update. Um, 
Global situation awareness. Uh, COVID-19 cases worldwide have crossed over 180,000. We'll look at the numbers here in a minute. But one uh, key fact I want to stress, because when it was global, we're like, okay, but now it's local, right? So WHO asked governments worldwide to pull out all the stops to fight this <coughs> pandemic. And that's kind of the backdrop that we have in our mind as we make decisions. Global case counts, if we can get a link, uh, link click, please. All right, uh, so as you can see, the numbers have already updated overnight to 187,000 and so, uh, and out of that, about 80,000 recovered. And like I you know, explained last time, the number appears to be low, but more people have recovered. They just didn't report back into their healthcare provider or to public health professionals that I'm better. So uh, the general data that we have is 80% or so have mild illness and they usually recover just fine at home. 20% might get some complications where they may need you know, medical help or hospitalization. And of course, there have been a few, few deaths. Out of the 187,000, there are about 7,500 reported deaths. That happens with large pandemics. Uh, it is a serious illness, but it is, again, you know, uh, a pandemic similar to what we've seen in the past with H1N1 and many others. Um, so uh, bringing it down back to the United States, so the situation is starting to get a little you know, heavier in the United States. We have about 4,600 or so cases. And over the last three or four days, what we're st starting to see is an exponential rise in cases nationally. That is not the case here locally in Tarrant County, but today is a significant day. So let me get to the next update. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, U.S., yeah, 4,600 plus cases, uh, 85 deaths. Most of those, about half of those are concentrated in Seattle. Um, and I forgot that I wanted to tell you that there are three states that are reporting generalized localized transmission. Uh, Washington State, the heaviest hit. New York State, the second heaviest hit. And then California, the third heaviest hit. They all have reported generalized localized transmission in their entire state. Um, uh, other locations like Tarrant County, we're, we're going to get here today. Last night I was building this slide and it said five cases including two limited local transmission. Limited local transmission meaning that we know a contact where they got this illness from. Well, as of this morning, we've declared we have a sixth case. Our first case of local transmission meaning we don't know where this person got it from. What I can tell you to reassure everybody is the person was a healthcare worker and have been seeing sick individuals throughout the week, so that's the likely source, but we don't have an identified contact at this point. So I want you to, if you wouldn't mind, please, I want you to go back over and define both the local <laughs> and those things, because I think we've used those, they've heard it, but I'm not sure they fully understand exactly what that is. So let's yes, sir. please go over So that typically way. how this starts is that we have imported cases with travel related illness coming to our communities, right? So that's an imported spread, very controlled situation. Most of the time we know about those folks. We have all our control measures, containment measures around those people, whether they need to be in the hospital for treatment if they're really ill or be isolated at home with a control <laughs> order that they can't go into the public. So all of that is being done. Containment has continued on. Then the next step where things progress to is that close contacts of those individuals may develop the case, right? You know, family members, coworkers, healthcare providers, or any other close contact that they happen to spend time with before they were diagnosed, but were already exhibiting symptoms. So then those close contacts are asked to isolate. And if they develop the disease, they get tested, and then they become cases. But then again, that becomes limited local transmission. That's the two that we had earlier on. And then in the beginning of the start of a general transmission, if you will, or local community transmission, you find somebody unidentified. There is no travel, no contact that you know where they got this disease. Um, so they were exposed in your community somewhere with an unknown source. So that's where we are today. So that's a significant <coughs> trigger event for decision making. So you you are labeling this sixth case as a localized community spread. So uh, we call it localized transmission, but it's like one step short of community spread. Community spread it would one be one step short. Right. Community okay. step would uh, you know community spread would be where we have multiple of those, and there's no clear definition whether it's two, three, five. When there are more cases that have unknown sources, that's when you have community spread established, right? 
okay. uh, because then you know in, in our case we could say that we think that there is a you know source in the patients that this person you know was seeing was it one patient two patient we don't know but there's an unidentified chain of disease in our community but when you have multiple unrelated scenarios like that occurring then there are supposedly multiple chains in your community that you haven't found and that's generalized spread of what's happening in Washington State, California, New York, multiple chains occurring that they don't know where these people are getting, like what we see in the flu season. Very rarely do we know where I got the flu, right? We, I mean, we might know, oh, my coworker was ill, but most of the time you just get the flu, you don't know where you got it. And that's the kind of scenario where you would see generalized community spread. And again, this is us kind of, you know, slicing and dicing to a fine level. For all practical purposes, we have local transmission in our community. You know, so this is a major public health trigger for decision making. And what I want to tell you is that we're early. We already pulled the trigger looking at what happened in Dallas County. So on Friday, March 13th, our county did declare an emergency and took a lot of uh, restrictive measures for large gatherings, you know, closure of schools and all those type of things. They're called social distancing measures. We already applied those early. Right? So that is very good that we got a good head start on this and we're trying to get this thing and phase in if we need to get further restrictions in. We're trying to phase in as we get more local triggers and today is one of those. Uh, before you proceed, so I have a question about the one step short of generalized community spread. Is there a threshold that you all usually use as a guide or is it, I mean, and I'm not asking for you to provide like an arbitrary number. Right. But. Uh, th like I said, there is no clear number that this is a line in the sand, but I mean, you know, if we have one more, <laughs> I mean, you know, you have two situations out there in your community, whether you want to call it then or you wait for three, there's really no clear set, but for all practical purposes, if we identify one more, it is generalized set spread in our community because there are potentially multiple people out there that we don't know that are carrying the disease. Okay. But this case number six, mm -hmm. you say was a healthcare worker who had treated persons who might have been positive for COVID-19. Right. Uh, that doesn't seem to me to be, to meet, to meet the definitions of a community spread. Right, and, and the, yes, it, it does not. But what it also tells us is that we don't have knowledge because you know, any healthcare worker. You can't uh, tie it to yes, one specific person. Yes, we can't tie it to one specific person. We're working through that list, but you know, that can be a big list because when you're a healthcare worker, you see several people a day and you don't always remember, so you got to go back through all the charts and everything. So it's hard to find a lot of times. That's, that's the honest <laughs> answer. Um, okay, so I know there's been a lot of questions coming about testing capability in our lab, and we're the public health lab. So I want to be very, very clear. We're not a diagnostic lab by design. Public health labs are not designed to do that work. We're usually surveillance labs. So we do sort of random sampling in the community to see what's circulating, like in the flu season or other situations. But in situations like these where other people don't have the capability, we're usually the first to come online because we're connected to state and federal resources where most of this you know, stuff starts flowing from. So we're the pinch hitters. Um, we don't have capability to take on a county of two million and test everybody. That's just the honest truth. We need help from our commercial labs and they have come online, but again, they're new to this, so it's gonna be a ramp up. So I just wanna make sure that we get that out there, that don't everybody start sending their patients to us because we just don't have that availability. I'm gonna explain here in a minute why. So as you can see, you know, we've been testing people and there's been surges and then there's been decline because that was a weekend and we're going to expect another surge in the week and that happens um, and we identified uh, you know i think the numbers when we were putting this together yesterday morning were that we had uh, tested 164 samples in our lab um, and that was for 64 people under investigation in the beginning cdc was saying take about a couple of samples uh, nasopharyngeal swab and oropharyngeal swab and then a couple of days ago they said well now only nasopharyngeal swabs are going to work fine because we know we have limited capability across the country. Uh, out of those in our lab we only found three positives out of 164 that we tested and the important fact to remember is that not all of them were Tarrant County people. We were at about 52 percent of the samples tested in our lab and rest was other counties. Uh, we serve a 33 county region 
those health departments don't have access to a lab other than us. So it's a very judicious use that we have to do with our resources. Um, and there are things that are happening that are developing, right? So we got an initial kit of about 1,000 reactions and 800 controls. And I know I'm getting into scientific info, but it's important for me to put it out there. Second kit came with 1,000 reactions and no controls. So we, in essence, had capability to test 1,800 samples. That doesn't mean 1,800 people, 1,800 samples. And the limiting factor was how many controls do you have because you have to run a control. So the strategy was to bash those samples so we can conserve our controls and maximize and get to the 1800. Yesterday, we ran into a situation where we're starting to run short on our reagents to extract the virus out of the samples. We're not out yet, but we have been talking to our federal partners, and they don't have any more in stock, and they're trying to get some more in stock. So we're trying to conserve and be very, very judicious of what we do, and that's where we are. I mean, that's the reality. We rely on our federal partners, and they're out. <laughs> Do the commercial labs have the test kits, the yes. reagents, and the controls? Yes, they do, but I don't have good insight into their numbers. I know our county judge is trying to help us get on calls with them uh, from their higher-ups and to figure out what capabilities they have from number-wise and how much of that capability is available for Texas, because these labs are handling a nationwide load. So that's the reality there. Um, and the route to access those resources, those commercial labs, is through your primary care physician? Yes, through your primary care physician, ideally, or an urgent care or a hospital setting. Again, most of the primary care docs do rely on commercial labs like Quest, LabCorp, Arab Labs, or sometimes even hospital system labs. A lot of them have those. And there are many small private laboratories that are bringing their tests online. Let so me, what stuff's the, working. Let, let, me, let me add to what your question was in the statement. Right now, what you said was correct, that you go into your primary care physician. Yesterday, I had a meeting or a conversation with the CEOs of the uh, various hospitals and health systems within Tarrant County. Uh, in addition to that, the medical director for MedStar, uh, Vinny and his group were on the line. Um, what we would like, or what I've asked them to see if we could put together, or if they could put together, was kind of a outline or a, a, a deal where we could make to the general public, you know, the thing we really don't want to happen is for folks to show up in our emergency rooms or to even show up in the doctor's offices for the most part. And so what, we're, what I've asked them to do is to see if we can come up with some sort of a step system where first off they call and may ask questions or they may be able to fill out a digital survey. And then at that point, and this is what, you know, this is just kind of what we outlined, they're going to come back, I hope, with the, what they feel like would be the best way of doing it. But then they might move to the next point, which would be they, the nurses would say, or the survey would say, okay, you now need to talk with a physician. And then the physician might then decide, okay, we believe you need to be tested or at least the, the test pulled. And all of that would happen outside of a provider's office or outside of an emergency room. Um, and that way people, at least in the beginning, would not even have to show up. They wouldn't have to come to an area where there are already sick people there. And so if they don't have COVID, then they're now going to be exposed to other things. They had their first meeting yesterday, and I have not heard back a report on that, but again, I'm going to depend upon them. You know, I invited the ones from Tarrant County, and I know that many of them spread and cross county lines, uh, but I'm hopeful that they're going to come back with this is the way we feel like we can best address that, and everybody's sharing that deal so that if one is one reaches capacity, then it moves to the next, then it moves to the next. Right. That's a tremendous step forward, Judge. If it considers that not everybody has the ability to pay, Texas is not a Medicaid expansion state. So a lot of people in our state do not have either insurance or another payment source for their health care needs. 
and along that lines, I agree with you 100%, and what my hope would be is that if we can do this kind of a process, and, they, and it gets to the point to where they have, the decision has been made that they need to be tested, then they will be given an appointment and a place to go to have that test done. There will be no charge. Excellent. And, you know, from what we hear from the federal government as well as from the state is that, um, you know, they're going to reimburse for that. Now, if someone, you know, and again, they may come back and say, we won't charge anybody that doesn't have insurance, but if, if, if they do have insurance, we may at least get that deal. That's, that's fine. That's what I'm depending upon them and hoping that they're going to come back with because I don't have the answers. Yes. Well, and I want to add to that. I mean, this this is part of what I wanted to ask is how are we providing essentially a decision tree, decision-making tree to the public so that they can easily navigate, well, okay, I have insurance, but I don't have a primary care provider, so I go where, or, or if I don't have insurance, um, but I have the ability to pay, or I don't have insurance, and I don't have the ability to pay. I mean, I know we can't necessarily – um, um, lay out every single scenario, but at least some general guidelines so that people aren't just kind of left wondering, well, where do I go and what do I do? If so. we get this accomplished, and, and kind of, again, they, this is going to change because they're going to come back with a better solution, I'm convinced. Sure. But what AT&T has said, basically, if we decide to do something along this line, we can have a, you know, basically a virtual hotline that everyone that feels like they have some questions about this, that would be the starting point. Mm -hmm. And that virtual hotline could go, you know, we could have 10 people answering the phones here, and then when that 10th one gets busy, it would automatically go to the next one mm -hmm. or go to the next one. And so that way we can have a much greater spread and have much more people, many more people involved with that. Sure. So the goal would be uh, for them not to be calling different places, but then to call into one place, we have a consistent message and that everybody can call in. We, you know, they, they already said, well, some of them have already digitized and said, okay, you can fill out the survey and send it in. The comment was made, not everybody has a computer. So that's why we're saying we, we want to start off at one place, mm -hmm. and then if they've got a computer and want to do it that way, they can do it that way. If they want to if they don't or don't feel comfortable doing it on the computer, they could call. Both will take, that will be the first step, and then from there, they'll eventually come back together after we get through that first step. And the first step is what the phone or what the website will say. Yes. And, and I expect that as we go along, and that's one of the other things that I've said to folks, if you've got statements, whether it be from mental health, whether it be from retirement centers, if it be from child care, um, your group come together, figure out what you want that common statement to be, and then once you get it, give it to us, and we'll look at putting it out there and, and inviting as many people as can that have websites to tag it and to bring it back to us to that central location so that hopefully that everybody that's got a child care center or everybody that's got a, you know, a, a clinic will have the same message and those messages will be consistent and not conflicting with one another. Um, I have a question about yes, the testing capability. So you elaborated on the number of test kits and what like makes up a test kit and also um, that the number of test kits does not correlate necessarily to the number of people, mm -hmm. right, that it would test or serve. Um, can you also talk about, even though you've explained kind of the limited purpose of most public health department labs, what's the capacity of our lab in terms of staffing, and is that anything that we should be taking into consideration? Yes, we have plans in play uh, that we're going to try to first use up internal resources and then bring outside help. Uh, county's being very generous with us, so I can assure you that we have no restrictions on that regard. The issue also at play is finding, you know, qualified people that can get trained and all those types of things. So we're sure. working through that, but our biggest hurdle right now is not the people, okay. it's the actual you know, machines and other capabilities that we need. And, and one of the things that you all heard us, and this is how good our county is, right? We made a decision on a Monday evening, and Tuesday afternoon we had already bought $100,000 worth of equipment because we knew the manual extraction was going to be slow and we would need to ramp up. That equipment has been delivered, installed, staff trained on it. We don't have the reagent from the federal government. 
So we're waiting on reagent, and then now what they've done is made a change on the reagent they're recommending because they're out of the reagent that was originally designed for that, and that creates another wrinkle. Those machines have programming cards that work with the new reagent, and now they're saying we only can, only can give you one programming card and we have two machines. So effectively, we'll only be using one machine in the beginning, right? So there's a lot of things at play that are internal technical things. We just need to just be patient and let our commercial labs bring their full capacity online. Because again, we're not designed to do this work in the first place. We're just here to pinch hit and look at very critical scenarios that truly meet the case definition and look at that. Out of those, we only found three, right? I mean, so that gives us some comfort. Now the situation is progressing and we have commercial labs that are online. We just need to start working with them more because the physicians are calling us saying, public health, take it, public health, take it. Well, no, <laughs> we can't. And I would say this about that. As, as Vinny mentioned earlier, I'm in the process of trying to communicate. There, you know, The question has been from various sources, how many tests have we done? Well, you just heard him explain that we've done approximately 180 that he has up here. But that's, you know, that's a, not a transparent number. I mean, yes, we've got to get to the point to where when we talk about the number of tests, I hope that we can get to the point of saying this is private, this is the county, so that we'll have an overall number and not be, you know, everybody be thinking, well, we've only done 180 tests right. since this thing started when we've, and more likely than not, we've done thousands of tests within Tarrant County to this point. For private labs, yes, sir. Yeah, yes. through the private labs. So we're in the process of doing that, and we want to be more transparent as we go forward yeah. if we can. When, and I understand that, and I appreciate the depth of your explanation because even if, you know, whoever who's not an expert in lab testing or epidemiology or public health, they, you know, the, your, your first thought, or at least what I've heard from um, people in the community is, well, they're not testing enough because they don't want to find out, <laughs> right? And so, but so those are legitimate concerns and questions right. that people have. And so right. even if, you know, they don't remember a week from <coughs> now all of the parts you know, that are necessary in order for us to perform the testing as providing the explanation in the context is hugely important. Right. So we're conserving the limited resource we have. And what I want to reassure the public is we're testing the people that absolutely textbook definition that clinically this person has the disease, has the travel, has the contact, and look at the numbers. We only found three positives in our lab. The other three have come from commercial labs. So it's a 50-50 Right? I mean, that's how it's supposed to work. We pinch it in the beginning, and then they bring in the masses from their capacity, right? So it's working. We just need people to be patient with us, and things are starting to happen, and we understand that, and the labs understand that, so they're bringing their resources online. Sure. Okay, so, you know, I was going to go over Tarrant County options, but we're very familiar that, you know, we declared a you know, local emergency on Friday the 13th. We took a lot of social uh, uh, distancing uh, guidelines on, on Friday. But I want to make sure that we all understand that guidance will be changing very rapidly. So stay in tune because the situation is evolving very rapidly. Um, you know, things were different yesterday than this morning. We have our first localized transmission case in Tarrant County. So that's a big, you know, decision-making day. And, you know, the next couple of days are going to probably bring more guidance. But we have to really be methodical and thoughtful. You don't just react to the situation. You think it through and you make the right decisions for your community. So that's where we are today. Okay, so the question is, why did we do it on Friday? We didn't have anything here in our Tarrant County community. Well, we looked at what was happening nationally, and there was a huge exponential spike, and that's only 2,000. Now we're at almost 4,700 in a matter of a couple, three days. So we saw this spike early. We saw what was happening in Dallas County, even though they're an entirely separate jurisdiction, we are one community. I mean, if anybody doesn't believe that, well, they need to look around because we are one community. We all go to each other's restaurants. We all go to their workplaces. I mean, we live in different communities. We work in different communities. So we're one community for all practical purposes. So they had a local trigger of a localized transmission, and we took proactive action, expecting that we were going to get our own local transmission. And here we are, three or four days later, we have our own local transmission. So we started early. So why are we talking about social distancing? And the reason being we don't have a vaccine or, or a particular treatment that just is a cure for this disease. There are supportive treatments. 
right? You know, if you get critically ill, they're going to put you in a hospital, give you fluids, give you any respiratory support if you need, uh, treat any uh, bacterial infections that might impact you. So they're going to do everything to protect your life and get better health outcomes for you. But that is not a cure. They're not treating the virus. They're treating everything else that's happening to your body as a result of that illness. And those are for critically ill patients. For everybody else in the community who's not ill, social distancing is a time-tested method that had worked over and over and over again in several pandemics. And the biggest one example being the 1917 flu. Example being cities who did this early had better results. There's a lot of graphics out in the media about comparison between city of Philadelphia and city of St. Louis. Philadelphia waited a few days. They had a, you know, more than a handful of cases, and then they put social distancing into effect, and the horse got out of the barn, and they had a huge spike. St. Louis learned from them, and on the first you know, case in their community, they said, we're going to social distancing. We're going to take strict measures. They still had cases, but it was a slow rise. They had almost one-fifth uh, of you know number of cases and deaths that occurred in their community and much better outcomes. Their healthcare system in 1917 was able to handle that pandemic much better than what Philadelphia did. So what you saw happening a couple of days ago, Philadelphia was almost the first one in the country to start taking very strict action. They learned from the pandemic in 1917 and took action in this pandemic and took very strict measures and others have followed through New York, LA and a lot of other places. And we're starting to get there. As you can see, more guidance is coming out from our leadership in the communities, and we're getting there. So what does all of this do? There's a term called flattening the epidemic curve, okay? And this is what we're trying to do. If you don't take protective action for your community, which is social distancing, then what we're going to see is a exponential rise, like what we're seeing for the national data right now. There's an exponential rise happening. And what that does is it creates poor health outcomes for your community because your healthcare system may not be able to provide the best care that they're currently capable of doing there just because they're gonna get overwhelmed, right? So too many people coming in for care. So they have to triage, they have to make decisions on the fly, and that changes health outcomes for people that could have gotten better with better care. If we can slow the rise, then our healthcare system can provide better health outcomes for our community, and that's what we want. Nobody's saying that social distancing is going to stop this pandemic dead in its tracks and we're not going to have another case. That's not the scenario. What we want is a slow, controlled rise so our healthcare system can handle the load that's coming their way, and then we can have better health outcomes, and we'll likely have less number of cases and less poor outcomes from that. So I know that's a lot of scientific talk, but let me try to break it down further. What does this all really mean? We're preparing for an increase in cases. We're realists, we know that it's coming. But we got an early start and we have a very good chance in our community to flatten that curve so our community fares better than others who did not have that opportunity. Like Seattle, it just broke loose. They couldn't really do anything, it broke loose in their community. We had that fair warning and we took action. Social distancing only works, and this is the key point here. It doesn't work because I said, or the county judge said, or elected official said, it only works if everyone does it. Every single one of us needs to take responsible decisions and actions for ourselves and our community. That's how social distancing works. And it has been proven to work for all of the pandemics that we've dealt with. So you look at the history, and make a wise decision for your own community as a community member. Okay, so takeaway messages for today. There is a lot of fear out in our community, people putting out their fears on social media for others to consume, and that frenzy you know, is starting. What we want the people to do is spread the facts about the disease and spread the facts about how social distancing actually works in your community and what you are doing to help with social distancing. I've seen so many volunteer messages Hey, I have a young individual who's healthy, and you're a neighbor who's a senior. Don't go out to the grocery store because I'm going to have my 17-year-old get you groceries and leave it at the door. I love that. That's the kind of camaraderie we need in our community. So again, that's just one example. There's a hundred, probably hundreds of thousands of examples that are out there. Our county is a volunteer-hearted county. We really need that. Learn from the experts and take action. And our community is very, very re resilient, and we are volunteers at heart, so let's work through this together. And that's the message. 
with that, I'll open it up for any questions, comments, anything that you I'm sure nobody has any questions. Uh, <laughs> Vinny, My yes, uh, Chair. I, must, I want to kind of briefly go through an email I received, and this is from a doctor friend of mine in Keller who is an MD. Yes. He has a friend who came back off a trip. He, he's not a practicing doctor right now. Okay. He's, I think, retired. His friend came back from a trip, ill, flu-like symptoms, went to her doctor, doctor tested her for flu, showed that she did not have flu, but she had typically the symptoms for coronavirus. He sent her to Tarrant County. She goes to Tarrant County. They basically said, we can't help you. We can't test you. I was under the impression that we had, as of this week, some commercial labs mm -hmm. that were testing. Why was she not sent? This happened Monday. Right. Why was she not told to go lab? Well, I'm assuming her doctor mm -hmm. would have had to have written some kind of, I don't know if that's order for that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Order or whatever uh, to one of the labs to do that testing, but. I mean, so without knowing the specifics of the situation, what I can tell you is there's misunderstanding and we're trying to clarify that with a lot of our physician community. The criteria that we follow do not apply to the private labs, right? We are following federal guidance because we're using a federal resource for our testing. We got the reagents and the test kits from the federal government. Test her. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the, her, the step her there. physician said. No, you said her retired physician. No, no, no. Her physician mm -hmm. told, said that she had the, the symptoms of coronavirus and needed to be tested. Right. So what's missing, just listening, and I don't have specifics, but just listening, they did the rapid flu test, which was negative, so okay, that's one step. Of step. What they probably missed was they did not order a viral panel, and they also did not do a strep throat test. So when the viral panel is done, it catches a lot of viral respiratory infections, including the common coronavirus, which has similar symptoms. It's just not as severe, but well, it has similar this, symptoms. This is all yes, sir. written in medicalese. Right? Bye. Yes, sir. I'll take it. Yes, sir. Okay. So that's probably why our folks said that we don't believe that that definition has been met, but that doesn't mean they can't go to a private lab with a doctor's, doctor's order and get those done. And we're trying to redirect people to those private That's labs. That's my question. Yes, sir. Why weren't they told that? According to this, yes, sir. your office called the doctor mm -hmm. and told them to quarantine. Right. That's the other way. If you don't have testing capability and the person does not meet the definition, but have some symptoms, stay home and see what happens. I mean, if you get better, you know, and you have been tested, you know, negative for the flu and everything's good, there is a lot of guidance coming down from CDC. How do you manage without testing? Because that's a reality across our country. So I'll take that information um, and then, of course, we'll look back into it. It depends on where they called. If they called the epidemiology team, they're probably going to get more guidance. Okay. If they call the general line. Another question that I wanted to ask CDC is urging people 60 and over to not go out, stay home. How are we as a county going to deal with that? Um, personal issue, my brother works for Harris County. He's 72 or three. They suggest, strongly suggested he go home. Yes, sir. And that's a prudent decision, okay? So we're leaving it up to the individual what's best for your health, right? JD but, got the memo. We didn't. <laughs> well, I'm giving you the memo today, but you all serve a critical function in the county. So, again, there are rules that apply and all those type of things. But, you know, anybody that's 60 or older, just by that fact alone, is at a higher risk. And then, of course, there are people who have underlying health conditions, whether you have diabetes, heart disease, uh, you know, COPD or emphysema where you have respiratory issues, long-term smoking, all those type of risk factors. If you have a transplant and you're immunocompromised compromised, or if you, people have HIV in our community, all of those folks are at a higher risk, regardless of age, but if they're 60 and over, even more so. 
So they need to make a wise decision for their health. All non-essential visits outside of the house, you know, they need to be careful. Do I really need to go somewhere because things are starting to grow, right? I mean, it takes a while for a person to get sick, get to the doctor, get tested. Is, it, is my visit outside of the home absolutely essential, or can I have a young individual who's probably healthy help me with groceries and other things and bring that to me so I don't have to go? And that's a personal decision that people need to take in the community. Okay, one more and I'm gonna leave you alone. Yes, sir. <laughs> Great questions, I appreciate it. I received a uh, email from the city of Grapevine uh, that their police were trying to reach your office Sunday. Yes, sir. And they, nobody's answering the phone. Well, um, we were, uh, at least 30 people were in the building, including myself, on Sunday. So if they were calling the general hotline, maybe yeah. that's why. Because <laughs> that line is now full, I mean, with voicemail. <laughs> I think on the general line, we've had conversations about extending the hours seven days a week. Right now, we're, it's you know Monday through Friday. I believe it's 8 to 5. I, you know, I think we're looking at trying to expand it you know, for seven days a week, maybe from 6 to 10. Uh, again, and, you know, if we have them, they would spend everybody mm -hmm. on the phone. I think as we begin to look for volunteers, or as we begin to be able to expand the lines through simply forwarding the phone, then we may, able, we may hopefully be able to do that, but we need them. Remember, they are monitoring the folks who they have put on home restriction. That means they're calling them every day. Um, they're, they're doing a lot of things that are maybe not, I don't want to imply that it's not critical to be on, available for these calls, but there are other things that they also have to look toward doing. So we're in the process right now of attempting to greatly expand the people who will be available for those calls. But certainly, my guess is they, they don't need the cities, their emergency managers, their police, their fire, they have other numbers than that general hotline, and I'm not about to give those out. Yes, sir. But um, they should have other numbers that they can call, yes, sir. and we'll uh, we'll make sure that we try to respond back. I understand the frustration, mm -hmm. and we've heard that. You know, I've heard that. Many has heard that. Uh, we're trying to as quickly as possible ramp up. Uh, again, volunteers are going to be critical, but we're at a time, and, and I've actually talked with the superintendents of the school, where many of their teachers are now at home, and. Um, Ask them to consider making those folks available, or at least seeing if some of them might be willing mm -hmm. to uh, to help in some of these regards. So right. this is a good point. This is well, a solution yes, we need sir. to find. Is it something we think that in the? I mean, is it something we're going to be talking about thirty days from now that we had that we're working on, or is it something that we're going to get done? No, sir. So two things parallel tracks. Healthcare line, our judges heading up that effort trying to get some relief on healthcare questions. I have two community partners working with us on the general call line. We're hoping to get this resolved by the end of the week. But the issue is not just the technology and the people, it's also getting them the appropriate education so they can exactly. answer the questions, right? I mean, I, so we're working on that and we're hoping to get that resolved by the end I'm of the week. Whoever answers that phone yes, sir. Can answer a question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. So. Well, I will add as an aside, and I want to be clear, this is not a complaint, is that the coronavirus hotline, that number and the number for my office are one digit different. I didn't so, do it. <laughs> I didn't do it. I know. I told her yesterday. That was total it, flu. It is what it is. And we, we've already prepped staff to be prepared for possible coronavirus hotline calls and to redirect. But just for the listening audience, that it is one digit off. So before you get upset thinking that you didn't reach the right office. Well, you didn't if you are calling the coronavirus hotline, but you reached my office, but just double check your dialing. Well, you're so, an EMT though, so you should be. I am, <laughs> which that leads me to my next question. Um, so when I, when I worked in the ER, um, 
you know, I was exposed to I don't, I don't know what, right? It had a needle stick. It was very easy because I knew which patient, right, and who I was performing a procedure on. I had exposure to TB. I don't know how ultimately they tracked what patient and all of that, but I had to go through that whole procedure. So for our, you know, healthcare providers who are potentially being exposed to patients with coronavirus who maybe never received a treatment, mm -hmm. um, how does all that work? Right. So here's what happens, right? I mean, we don't have unlimited supplies of personal protective equipment either. So in the beginning, when we're in the middle of the flu season and respiratory virus illness season, they take just basic precautions that they need to take. Now that we have a local trigger, you might start seeing people putting on more personal protective equipment because now they don't know if you've got the flu or coronavirus or something else. But again, they have to be judicious about the use of their supplies because if they use it for every patient, then you know, you're gonna run out. To relieve that, federal government did push out some early supplies from the strategic national stockpile. So it arrived in San Antonio a couple days ago. I have heard last night that it did arrive in the DFW area for the, I forget the full term, but they're called the regional racks that are the hospital groups that deal with that asset and the distribution of supplies is starting to happen to the hospital system. All of that takes time and it's gonna relieve some of that worry about uh, personal protective equipment being available, right? And this is, again, early supplies. We did amass a massive strategic national stockpile to deal with these situations. Full load of that has not been released because we are too early in that scenario, but some states like New York you know, and Seattle, Washington area, and California might be requesting those assets early because their healthcare system is feeling the burn at this point from, from those situations. Thank you. Judge, my questions are not public health questions. They relate to county policies, practices, and procedures that I would like to see relaxed in order to uh, not exacerbate the effect of the spread of this disease in our community. Uh, you want to take those now or you want to get through with Vinny I, first? I, I tell you what, why don't we, I agree and, and we need to have a general discussion about several things in that regard. Uh, I think I would prefer that we at this point in time, if we have any more questions of Vinny, that we do that, and then we kind of get into a general dis, you know, discussion about what as a county we're trying to do. Um, so if you have another question for Vinny. I do. I have one more. Um, so yesterday evening, Representative Turner hosted a teletown hall with uh, representatives from Arlington, Grand Prairie, myself, Dr. Tanasia, Mansfield ISD, and Arlington ISD. And so they had hundreds of people who phoned in to participate in the call, and of course we weren't able to get to all the questions. So this is one question last night that we weren't able to get to that I know that you will have the answer for. Um, how will we as a community be able to differ differentiate this virus from other underlying problems such as allergies? <laughs> That's a great question. So allergies typically, you know, give you the runny nose, the <clears throat> eyes, maybe a little dry cough. This virus starts off with a dry cough, but the, the key indicator is dry cough with a fever, right? I mean, that's like your big factor. Now you have an infection. Allergies typically don't give you fever. They use, I mean, and there's hay fever out there, so, you know, it's not a blanket statement, but typically seasonal allergies don't give you fever. That's a big differentiator. If you have a fever with a cough or a runny nose, you've got some kind of an infection that's causing that for you. So at home, that's all you can do, right? In the beginning of all of this, and we're at the tail end of the flu season, but it's still pretty widespread, so don't you know, start thinking, oh, I have COVID-19. You have probably the flu or another respiratory illness. But as we get, to get more cases, it is likely that you might have been exposed and all those times, but that's still further out. We're not at widespread community spread at this point. So don't be thinking at home you have COVID-19. And that's the main thing that people need to understand because there's so many requests coming to the doctor's offices. And while I have symptoms consistent, why don't you want to test me? Because we don't believe you have COVID-19. Data is not showing us that. So that's the answer. But key differentiator is cough with fever versus just a cough. Thank so, you. 
the trigger for our managers and department heads sending a person home from work is a fever. A lot of things. So that's a that's a long answer. Anybody with symptoms, yes, you know, cough fever, shortness of breath, yeah, they can, you know, and again, I'm not making a county policy, but they can be qualified to be sent home for the interest of that building and that department. Um, but again, to be run through their supervisor, their department head, and all of that with consultation with county policy, so they need to call Mr. Manius to make sure that that's still what we're doing. Um, and the easiest thing is while that decision is happening, if you have availability of a face mask, just a regular surgical mask, the person who's coughing and sneezing needs to put that on so you don't, you know, in fact, others would whatever you've got. So that's an, that's an easy thing. The other thing is we just finished spring break. So there's a lot of people who return from overseas. Travel history. See what happens worldwide. We're seeding this virus all across the world. So a lot of people who return from overseas, especially from Europe right now, we need to make sure that you're staying home. That's, that's a big, big factor. Specific case, one of my uh, road crew employees went to his supervisor this morning and said, I have a sore throat, do I need to go home? And the question was asked, well, do you have a fever? Mm -hmm. Person said no. Uh, and so the decision was made, uh, you probably don't need to go home at this point. That's right. Uh, why don't we watch it and uh, you go home to work? Right. Again, judicious use, and if you have any concerns, of course, you know, look some information up online or call us at Public Health, and I know we're going to drown in all of those calls, but that was a wise decision because what happens with sore throat, there's so many causes for sore throat. We get that all the time. So why should we think that we have COVID-19 and go home? We shouldn't. Nothing out there in our community suggests that every person walking on the street has COVID-19. There's no data to suggest that. So that was a very wise decision of, you know, using county resources wisely. One thing I would maybe ask you to talk a little bit more about, and I may have been, I may have missed a part of the discussion, but we've heard all this noise about the drive-throughs. And I think there's a tremendous amount of confusion mm -hmm. by the general public as to what those drive-throughs, you know, if, if there's one set up, and we've heard a lot about the ones that are being set up in Dallas, and I know that I mentioned earlier that some of the health systems may be, you know, setting up, but as you, I think you clarified, just talk a little bit about the drive-throughs right. again. So, again, if we can bring all the resources of the private labs with us, you know, the drive-throughs can be made possible. But I can tell you the original intent and design of that is not really for just everybody driving through and getting a test because that doesn't solve any problem, right? I mean, data does not suggest that 2 million people in our county are going to test positive. That's just not there. So what we're going to hope and try is, again, prioritize people who are at the highest risk. You know, if you have any risk factors or if you're symptomatic or if you're in a critical infrastructure type of job, whether you're a healthcare worker, first responder, law enforcement, you know, any kind of uh, government worker that needs to be at their job and you're starting to show symptoms, okay, let's get you through the testing, see if you have COVID-19. If you don't, keep doing your job, right? I think that's going to be the starting point, but again, it may get expanded if the disease grows in our community. Again, yesterday, the governor, along with the mayor of San Antonio and the county judge at Bear County had a press conference and they, you know, Bear County was the first place where they kind of did the drive-throughs, and it got out of control very quickly. Uh, and I thought the governor did a very good job of basically detailing what you just said, that it was first off for first responders. It was not just the general public. And you still had to do, you still did the screening. And not it wasn't just a matter of, okay, I think I'm sick. I'm going to drive up, and I'm going to get this test. So it's, it's very important for everybody to understand that in the future, if we should set these up, that it's not going to be a matter of, okay, I see one over here, I'm going to just drive through while I'm out you right. know, going to pick up the kids or doing whatever. That's right. Hopefully they're not going to pick up the kids because the kids are with them. That's right. And thank you for clarifying that because it's very important for our community to have that mindset early because 
when we hear the term drive through we think, oh, well, that's for me. I want to go just like I go to McDonald's. I'm going to go through here, get tested. Yeah, not, that's not the design and intent of that. It is, again, always methodical. And I'm going to keep repeating this. We're going to be very methodical about this. No matter what everybody else is doing, we're going to be very judicious about what we do in our county. So let's all work together on that. Maybe a, a friend of mine told me yesterday that he got tested Sunday. Don't know. He went to Southwestern. His wife, I think, worked for some major corporation, and that's how they set something up. Doesn't matter. He said it took three hours. Three hours. From the time they tested, they swabbed, give him a result. Is that normal? Um, it depends on where they got their tests run. If they had an in-house lab, which they're starting South to come Western. on. Yeah, so a lot of the in-house labs are starting to come online, and they can you know turn the results out around in usually three to four hours. Okay, so that's yes, kind sir. of yes, it, sir. It's it's in, in what the judge said. Right. People, you know, people see a drive-through. Oh, I'm right. gonna get tested. But, but th that's what I was trying to say. It depends on what setting that is, right? So this seems like they had an individual sample, and the machines were available, and the people were available to do it, right? Our turnaround time is one to two days. That doesn't mean the tests take that long, but our machines could be busy sure. running other tests. Our people could be busy doing other functions, and then we are waiting for the batch to be big enough so we don't waste our resources. So again, it's a management technique that we have internally in the labs, and, and all labs do it, is that we're going to wait till the batch gets big enough that we can make the machine full and make the best use of capacity. But you know, if a high critical thing comes that we need to do it today, like right now, yeah, I mean, any lab can turn that around in three to four hours, because that's usually the time. I want to say four to six hours because it takes a little bit longer, but you know, yes, it can be done. It's just not a routine okay. thing but that you can expect you every day. You don't just drive up, yes, get a sir. Swab, and they run it through a machine. And right, and for those go. scenarios, here's I here's think you're gonna you're gonna wait a little bit longer. If you are in a drive-through, so you're you know, visual is like you could be collecting twenty thousand samples in a day. Well, that's gonna back up for a while. Sure. So that's the reality. <laughs> So, so the private labs, do they turn it around once, is that, is that what the doctors should expect, uh, a, you know, a same day turnaround or is, it's my understanding the private labs are taking longer than Yes, sir. So many things that happen. So some private labs that are local and are smaller, we've seen it turn around the same day, but that's not always the case but because what's happening in the lab we don't know bigger private labs that have really deep resources like LabQuest and, and uh, or LabCorp and Quest Diagnostics, they're taking a little bit longer because they're getting the load of the entire country at this point. And from what I understood, a lot of their labs are not in the FW area. They're out of state in California. And you know, California got hit, Washington State got hit, so they're getting a lot of testing from there as well. So what they've told us is, including shipping time, 72 to 96 hour turnaround, but it's going to keep getting longer okay. as more and more people ask for tests. So again, I keep coming back to judicious use of resources nationwide is needed. So speaking of the private labs, what are their requirements to report the number of tests that they've conducted and then the results of those tests? I don't know that there's any requirement to report the number of tests that they've conducted. Okay. But by law, they report uh, test results that are positive to local and state health departments. Because if it's a condition like this or any other uh, condition that may cause an outbreak, usually that's a reportable condition situation. And by law, we have physicians' offices that are required to report, laboratories that are required to report. And in general, the law is that broad. Anybody who is aware, right? But that doesn't happen because you don't know confirmed test results and we don't want a whole ton of false reports. But typically that would be a school or a daycare that they found from the parent, oh, my child had salmonella, so I need to take him away. And they shared enough information that the daycare may report to us, well, salmonella can spread, right? So, you know, we get that report. Um, so that kind of stuff. So that's how the labs are reporting to us as well. We get those results from private labs. In our case, out of the six, Three were from private labs, and three were from our own lab. Again, um, as we said, uh, the one thing I want everybody to understand is we can say something this minute, and five minutes from now, that can change. I just got 
an email that indicates that Dallas just announced that they have nine new cases. So um, rapidly evolving. It's rapidly progressing, and you know, again, what I what I, you just need to understand that if you hear something today, right now, that you could hear us say something totally different in a matter of minutes or a matter of hours or a matter, a matter of days. Um, this is something that we're constantly, again, we're trying to get ahead of, and we're trying to be very proactive. Um, we're rapidly approaching the time when we're going to be reactive. And so I think we've just got to keep moving that forward. Um, so, you know, I would just please ask everybody to remember that. Right. And the example that I will also use, and I will, you'll hear other examples as we go through this, Thursday night, we all sat around a table and said we were not going to recommend closing the schools. We were going to leave that up on an individual by individual basis. Less than 10 hours later, we came in and talked with the superintendents and with the school folks and decided to close the schools for a matter of 14 days subsequent to their the end of their spring break. Right. So things are constantly moving, and the one thing I would just ask everybody to say is, this may be what it is the last time I heard, but it may have already changed from that standpoint. So can I make a quick comment, and I'll, I'll close with that. You know, people really need to follow the lead of their leaders, and I want to tell, I've worked with you all individually, the best leadership anywhere that I've ever worked with. So I want to first credit you all for doing what you're doing because these are hard decisions for our community. But I also want to share the credit with my department. Those folks have been really, really working hard. Saturday and Sunday was quite visible. You know, there were 30 to 40 people in the building really working on their days off, and they had been working throughout the week. One lady I had to send home because she had been on call all night. She was without sleep for 36 hours and drowning in calls. So I had to just put a stop for her. You go home and sleep. So that's the kind of effort that our county is putting in. And the same thing's happening in our labs. You know, their families and kids and babies that they had to put to sleep, and they're coming back after that to run the tests. So again, I just wanted to share that inside information. And I've had so much support from all of these departments that are behind us. A lot of support. So our county is at work. People just need to work with us and really follow your lead on making sure that this works for our community. And what I'm hearing from commissioners, from everybody, the, the telephone, we're going to work toward getting one number for each. It may be each instance. It may be from the general. It may be from whatever. But we're going to try to, again, funnel all of these responses from different groups or different that into, uh, into a number and those things will be posted on our website as we go forward. Uh, it may deal, there's this number for the nurses, or it's this number for the, uh, for the general info, or it's this number for whatever, uh, and, and try to focus that in. And I would just ask that when you go and you're looking for this, go to a trusted website and stay away from the crackpots. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a right. technical term. Yes, sir. One more thing, Vinny. So I, I can't even begin to thank your team for all the work that's being done. And really, that's countywide. And as the judge has said, and it, it certainly bears repeating that this is going to take all of us for us to try to flatten the curve, right, and uh, have the least amount of impact on our community. When we talk about making sure that we're taking care of those who are closest to home, that does mean our team members. So. I know we're going to have a conversation later about what that what what all that really means and commissioner brooks had already started to ask some questions about his team i've surveyed my team to see at least initially what concerns do you have what questions do you need answered um are you stressed out um are you you know depending on the situation with your spouse or significant other are there food insecurity issues are there child care issues so i would like to hear from you at some point what measures do we need to take to make sure that we're caring for not just the physical but also the mental needs yes. of our team who are mm -hmm. on the front line and I see Susan Garnett is here and I, yes. I know that we have the resources here but we should have that guidance so that um, hopefully 
for those who are closest in working on this that they can make sure that they're taking care of themselves because right. that's the only way that we're going to be able to serve our community right. to the best of our ability. So stress is obvious but we'll share the details because our team is actually pulling all of that together right. um, and we'll bring that plan to you how we're going to sort of reorganize internally and then you know plug in help that's being offered to us. So we're really appreciative and we're going to make this work. So I just want to say that it's working and we're going to make, yes. continue to make it work. And Commissioner, <laughs> I very much appreciate that. I, you know, I got into the elevator yesterday with someone and I could just sense that they were very anxious. Mm -hmm. um, and we will, I hope, very shortly, again, on our website, have a number for people to call that will be answered 24-7. Uh, if they're feeling anxiety or they're anxious or they just want to talk with someone, uh, yes, Susan is here. We've, we've begun some conversations with her, um, and we will, you know, we're going to we talk about that. But, again, this is a 24-7 thing, okay. and uh, we just need to continue to be aware of it. And something that we didn't think of today and we'll think of tomorrow, hopefully we'll have an answer up in you know, 24 hours or 48 hours after that, we're going to have to act quick. Some things we can act quick on. Some things will be a little bit more deliberate because it may take a little bit longer to get an educated call line going versus just you have some general questions. And we can put somebody uh, at that chair with the frequently asked questions. And then if we get to one that's more technical, we push it up the line, but we keep the ones that are more technical from having to answer the ones that are very general. And that's going to be our, our approach to just about everything we do. Sure. Um, Vinny, don't go far. Yes, sir. Because I be just ready. have an idea that some of the things we're fixing to start talking about are going to be things that you're going to have an opinion yes. on, and we're certainly going to be interested in hearing that opinion. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Vinny. Before we kind of get into this general and some very specific discussions, I want to give you just a little bit of, a, of an update uh, on where we've been going and what we've been trying to do. Um, first off, I've asked the, the DA, uh, we're trying to get some relaxation on our ability to communicate among ourselves. I have had communications with the governor's office about seeing what we could do regarding uh, either suspending or adjusting a little bit the whole open meetings and the things that we have to go through. And I, I want to again begin by complimenting the governor because in every press conference he has held, he has really stressed the importance of allowing flexibility among the local elected officials. And I know that we've, you know, there's, there's been times when we've had issues but I cannot, I couldn't be prouder of what has happened thus far and the, the willingness and, of the state at all levels uh, to be open and to being willing to sit down and talk and also being as flexible as they can be about letting local elected officials make these decisions. So I, I do want to, but we've asked them. I'm certainly glad to hear you say that. Well, yeah, I know there's a lot of people I've had to pick up off the floor <laughs> uh, when I made that statement. Um, but I do believe that they're, they're bending over backwards to help us and to be there in every way, shape, or form that they can. Um, you know, we're going to do certain things and we're going to try to stay as, as closely in communication as we legally can um, so that we can do that. Other things is transparency. We're constantly getting asked questions about this, that, or the other. Uh, and understand that part of the things that we have to be able to get relaxation on is the HIPAA rules. But I will tell you, in, in working with Vinny and in working with the DA's office, you'll notice that yesterday, as we began to list the cases that we have, we are now saying what cities they're from. We're not yes. going to give out names. We're not going to give out addresses. We're not going to give out employers. But what we are going to be able to say is we have this many cases and they are in these cities. So that's one step toward doing that. That's helpful. Um, so we're, we're going to continue to try to do that. And if we can become more transparent, we'll try to become more transparent as we go down the list. Um, I've talked about the trusted 
websites. Um, you know, I, let me just say the proclamation we put out on Friday basically su strongly suggested no gatherings in excess of 250. Yesterday, in communications with uh, Fort Worth and Arlington, what we said was that we wanted to reduce that to 50% of the occupancy of a facility with a maximum of 125. Now, again, that was before we had this case that Vinny talked to us about. It was certainly before we realized that Dallas was going to announce that they have nine new cases. Um, so we're going, you know, that's the recommendation we have out there in print right now. But, you know, one of the things I want to tell you is my strong recommendation is you don't go out and let's not go and have a party. I mean, if you want to go to a restaurant and eat, you can go to a restaurant and eat. You've heard Vinny say social distancing is so critical. And by that, I mean, I look out here and y'all are apart. And I appreciate that. The determination, at least at this point in time, from my public health folks, is that this is happening and this is being transferred through social, through basically droplets, yeah. which means it's not just lingering in the air, but if you got a, you know, if you got somebody who spits when they talk, or if they're coughing or whatever, if you're six feet away from them, our hope is you won't get it. We have said to our, to the sheriff's department, at where they enter the courts, we've talked about it down in the lines, both at the tax department. Motor vehicles area. I know the county clerks try to spread those lines out. If you've got somebody backed up in motor vehicles, try to make sure that they're six feet apart. But you know, don't go have a to a bar to have a celebration tonight on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, stay at home and watch something on TV. Um, don't you know? I'm, I'm really want to discourage y'all or anybody, and I want y'all to help in this, to discourage folks from gathering together in any numbers. If you can stay at home, stay at home. Um, if you need to go out to eat, go out to eat. My guess is there won't be any problem social distancing in most of the restaurants. Um, so if you can drive through, drive through. And again, our recommendation, the most recently printed one, was 50% of occupancy up to 125. I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm just going to discourage you from, especially from going, okay, we're going to celebrate St. Patrick's Day today in the bar. Don't do that. If you can, just just don't do it. Um, with that, I think I want to, let's open it up and let's begin talking about some of the things as a county that we want to do. and. Glenn, why don't you talk about, this is something that came up yesterday in the meeting with Betsy, the meeting list, if you're in a meeting. Great idea. Okay. Uh, one of the things that Fort Worth has started, and I want to encourage everybody to do, is create a contact journal. Uh, my preference would be that if you're in a meeting, that someone in that meeting, or who maybe whoever created or started, or call that meeting, that they be sure to have a list of the people that were there and their email and or telephone numbers. And the day. And the day. What I would like, so that means if I, go into a, if I go into five or six meetings, what I need to put down is what meetings I attended, and then we'll be able to go back to whoever that contact person was, and they'll have the list of everybody that was in that meeting. If, if somebody were to get that virus, the health department won't be running all over the world trying to find out who was in that meeting. So that's we'll so that list. Please, please do that. So encourage someone to have a list of everybody that was in the meeting, and then you be sure, if you didn't call the meeting, that you be sure that you have in your calendar, okay, I went to a meeting, I went to a commissioner's court meeting. Now, so in order to promise what I'm, or to Practice what I'm telling you. We're going to put a sign-in log outside the door, and I would hope that every one of you, as you leave, with a distance of six feet apart, or maybe we'll start it and start passing it around, I want you to put down there that you were attending this meeting 
so that if one of us comes down with it, then Vinny will give that list to Vinny and his people will have to begin making contacts to see if you're showing any symptoms. So, Teresa, get us a couple of pads of paper, bring it in here, and we're going to start passing the list around. And Teresa's the one that's listening on the, in my office. So if y'all are trying to figure out, okay, who's Teresa in here? Okay, and then is everyone going to use their own pen? Yeah, yeah. yeah let's okay. do that. All right. So, Vinny, not that you all need any more to do, but um, at, you. if you could weigh in on what that what that list needs to look like, what are the things we need to be sure to capture? To the 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 judge mentioned it, but just to make sure we're actually getting you the information that you need. Right. So a, a legibly printed name. So don't just scribble something that we can't read because it's handwritten. And then a working phone number where we can reach you uh, ideally 24 7 because you know stuff's happening throughout the night and all those type of things that's the bare bit so what we've done in let me, let me, I'm, I'm, well, let me just let me just say that anytime we update our recommendations we will post that on our website and if you go to our website and you click on the little red bar that's across the top it will take you to um, a little site that shows all of our proclamations, discussions, and things along that lines. And then one other thing, and I'm going to apologize for it now, and hopefully we're going to get it, we'll be able to correct it. We're working on getting it corrected, is we will start doing these closed captions or sign language for those people who uh, are deaf and cannot, you know, cannot hear. Yeah, the, the reason. Go ahead, GK. Yeah, the talking about the meeting attendance rolls, that was something in the, in the memorandum that we sent out right. yesterday, oh. and we we asked was that the you know the log should contain the attendee's name printed, uh, the, a work and personal telephone number. We also uh, stated that the the log should be stored in your department, so every department should keep that rather than try to compile it in one central location. Okay, GK, take it away. Is there, I think, Commissioner Brooks? I've got three things. Okay. Well, maybe four things. One is an observation that if this court were to follow the directive that everybody over 60 ought to consider staying home, yeah, we, we wouldn't have a quorum for this meeting. That was the meeting. And uh, I would like to see the governor consider letting us meet by other means than coming down here yes. and we, sitting in our chair. We have yes. talked with the governor's office about that. We also have the ability, and we're, the DA may want to respond to this, but um, I know that right now universities and I believe cities and maybe even we have the ability to do that. The, the requirement that I know that universities are operating under is that the person who is presiding over there has to be at where the meeting would be. But then each one of y'all might be able to call in and do that. The meeting has to be recorded. Uh, in, some, in some clarification from the governor's office, Right now, I believe that we also have to have a 1-800 number for the public to call in, and that's where it could get a little, you know, I love to be able to say we've got to record it, we've got to make it available, uh, we've got to have it available live, but we don't have to have public comment. Yeah, as of right now, you have to have a number for the, for the public to be able to call in and to have. Does it have to be an 800 number? Yeah, as, as of right now, and it doesn't specifically say whether it has to be 800, but uh, what 800 number, but the public has to be able to call in and make comment um, during that televised meeting. So you still have that requirement, although there has been a relaxation of me being able to meet face to face. And and there and there has to be people as of, as of right now, people either have to be able to come to the location where it's usually being held and um, be, have that be, be able to actually listen to that meeting 
or just be able to call in and listen to it or can, as long can, as they can communicate. Can we get that set up for our next meeting? If we could, it would allow we, Commissioner exactly. Johnson yep. and you, you to all, participate. And that, that law is in place right now, right. so you can absolutely use that. And you do have to, when you do the notice as well, you have to have that information in your notice so that they, people understand how they can participate, how they can watch it, and that is going to be some in some shape, form, or fashion video conferencing. But um, we will be willing to work with um, GK's office or with your offices to get that set up. I know, I know that Commissioner Johnson may be the eldest one, and I'm sure he's the eldest one on the uh, court, but there's probably about four of us that yeah. have, would have a hard time being in the over six. Only, we only got like one youngster. Only Devin would be sitting here. I'll be here. Because we've got something in our system called go to meeting we could probably continue to broadcast like we do this is Devin are you listening you're the one sent me this <laughs> uh, and yesterday my IT person put my phone up to go to meeting and I think you could broadcast it via like we're doing now. Yeah, and the, the one thing, we, and, and I'm not, I'm not sure uh, the full capabilities of go to meeting, but we have, we have to make sure that we're not technologically uh, making it impossible for anyone to cooperate. So long as someone can pick up their phone or their cell phone and dial in and communicate with you guys while that meeting is going on, then that would be legal. Why don't you let us work on it? There's, there's and, a bunch of different. And, and one other, I mean, to that same end, if we're here. Can we require the public to come here if they want to ask a question? I'm just saying I don't need an answer right now, but as, as Mr. Mania said, this is a lot of what we do here today may be in an effort to say by next week we would like to have a policy in place and not necessarily pass a lot of things today that may or may not have been on the agenda. Absolutely, and we'll take a look at that, and we'll work with the administrator's office to make sure that it's legally compliant. Okay. Thank you. That was my observation. I've still got three things. I, I know. I'm counting. Okay. <laughs> uh, the first is employees without leave time who may have to take time off because of child care issues or whatever. I note that that may be addressed by the negative comp time uh, discussion in this memo that you sent around yesterday. Yes, sir. That would be a great help if we could put that in place. Yeah. I thought I would just go through when, whenever it's whenever you all are ready. I was going to go over that memo itself. So, okay. My questions the, are all over the place, so um, I can't remember. <laughs> So I think, go through the memo now? I think you're, you're, you're very, I mean, I think we all are all over the place yeah. on our questions. I've yeah. got, I keep putting things down here on my little list. So that Thing was two. number two. Number, number three. Okay, number three. Well, you ain't going to do that to me. I'm, I'm counting. Okay, number three. As many, ask as many as you want. A lot of the courts have addressed dockets and jury trials and the like because of the virus. I would like to see us not create new homeless people during this time by putting a suspension on evictions, forcible detainers, writs of possession that will put people out of homes we, for a period of 60 days. We asked the JPs, we had a meeting of the judges uh, last Thursday or Friday. The yes. days are kind of blending. But uh, one of the things that we asked the JPs to look at is to, to stop evictions altogether right now. And they're exploring whether or not 
they can do that or if there's certain legal barriers that prevent them. But we've asked them to stop all evictions. We've talked with the constables too at this point in time. Well, the rents of possession is a constable function. Okay. So. Cities, I know a couple cities in my area have done kind of similar things like for water service. Yes, they, they have disconnection of utilities. They've suspended disconnecting any, any water lines for non-payment right now. I have talked with Encore regarding electricity and what they have gotten back with me and said was that as soon as the governor issued the state of emergency or the state of disaster, the PUC then puts in certain, that triggers certain things that uh, these carriers or these, you know, retail electric companies, whatever it may be, it triggers things that they can do. And, and that was in just that instance. But that's a good question. And this way we're getting that out. So, okay. My fourth okay. thing, okay. and then I'm done. Thing number four. I appreciate the directive by the mayor of Fort Worth to her police department asking them not to arrest people for lower level offenses during this time. I would like to see us do at least two things. Number one, close our jail to misdemeanor offenses. And number two, look at our current census and determine how many misdemeanors we have in jail because they could not afford to bond out and let's try to get them out of jail again when we talked with the judges last week one of the things that we had one of the things that they are indicated that they're going to attempt to do is one if someone's out on bond right now instead of setting a hearing and bringing them in they're going to try to you know not do that not bring those folks in for those folks who are in jail, they want to continue to try to deal with them. They're working with the sheriff's office, uh, again, with, uh, with the courts to try to get as many folks out as they can. So that'll be part of that, that process. Um, you know, the jail is really on guard and really trying, they've stopped visitations. They're doing things to try to keep that, and our, you know, our, Jail you, is, you can't really enforce social distancing in jail. No. Other than locking people down, and that's not going to work. No, well and, and they're not trying to, you know, again, they're, they're really working with their folks to try to make sure they take all the precautions to try to stop from happening, you know, an outbreak within the jail. Uh, our, our jails had just gone through their uh, jail inspection and again passed with flying colors uh, just as they have for the last 25 26 maybe 27 years they do a great job facilities does a great job uh, it's kept clean uh, so i feel very good about it and i know they're very much on top of that uh, and they've got the ability to go places uh, and to put those prisoners if someone does end up uh, beginning to show any symptoms. I'm sure all of the above is true, Judge. But people on misdemeanor offenses do not need to be in jail, uh, lacking some other hold of some kind. I agree. We need to get them out of jail. Thank you. I, I, I don't disagree at all. So some of my questions were related to ones that Commissioner Brooks already asked um, regarding the eviction, so that was answered. And just to make it clear that we as a county are not a utility provider, so there there is no capability for us to suspend disconnection of something that we don't provide. So just want to make that clear. Um, but it would be nice to your point for us to have posted what the utility providers do have in place, especially given the governor's declaration. Um, I'm assuming, obviously, that they have their own outreach efforts to their customers, but 
just so that we are sticking with providing factual information to as many people as possible. I'd like to see that posted. Um, regarding the, the jail, um, and I'm not sure who this question is for, but what is our process of screening staff that works in the jail and then also um, inmates as they are, um, before they, as they come in, and when they're brought from the various uh, jurisdictions? Well, I can answer the inmate issue. Okay. And um, we, anyone that enters the back of our jail uh, is triaged by, by healthcare professionals both uh, for physical health and also mental health. I mean, that's that was that's standard, though, right? Okay, so what are, are we? Everybody is being. That, and that covers, obviously, it's screening. For, everybody, their temperature, you know, it's my understanding that everybody that walks in the jail right now is being screened as far as temperature. That's one of the first things that happens. They, they do have to go through this other, but even before they get, start the whole booking process, they're being screened as to, temperature and some of those and if there's anyone here from the sheriff's office that knows anything better about that then again we ask everybody to stay away that didn't have business so okay is that all your questions no I was taking oh. notes um let's see so what are our legal options regarding the upcoming municipal election um and I know that's still some ways away, but any decisions or planning that we need to take into account now? That is something that we have asked. Uh, Hodder, our elections administrator, has been asked that question, and we're, you know, we're, we've sent that question to Austin. That will have to be something that the governor would have to, uh, I think, do in order to try to delay or suspend that for the time being. And remember that the May elections are mostly municipal elections. So, and those are actually conducted for the municipalities. So, right. so we're still actually, talking about a gathering of people and use of equipment yeah. and disinfecting it and all of that. So. Yeah, yeah. I, and, we've, and we have already, we had already talked with Hyder about implementing measures uh, to do the cleaning and, you know, looking at the cleaning and trying to make that part of the process better. Sure. So um, the state had announced that the DMV was waiving certain requirements for vehicle registration. What does that mean for us and our business operations? Wendy? Aren't you happy I came? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, the DMV has extended the registration an additional 60 days beyond uh, the final day for uh, this uh, current uh, virus so uh, there is an additional 60 days there's also an additional 60 days for driver's license expiration as well uh, we encourage all of our customers to utilize our online services our online services are safe and virus free thank you to our IT department I'll give them credit for that uh, so we encourage all of our customers to uh, do all of their business uh, electronically. We also have drop boxes as well. Uh, if someone does not have electronic capabilities, we have drop boxes at all of our offices, and we can take care of that business that way. Thank you. Anything further, ma'am? No. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So this question is going back to the coronavirus hotline, and perhaps I missed the response, but I don't know that I heard specific things that we need to do to increase capacity for, for that. What, are there any decisions that require court action? So uh, like I was stating earlier, um, there is the general line for you know the general public to call, and we're working with a couple of community partners to expand that capacity, hopefully, hopefully within this week to 24-7. But again, you know, we got to wait till they can get their capability online and then for them to be trained to answer the questions. And then we're also trying to sort of um, pass medical questions on to a more, um, you know, a nurse hotline type of deal that our judge is trying to help us coordinate with the area hospital partners and other entities that can do that kind of stuff. Um, so all of that is in the works. It should be coming on soon. I don't have a firm date, but we're trying our best to get it on as soon as possible. And let me say, we will 
we are really working on getting that up and going just very, very quickly, and I think we can expand. Uh, we've had some, you know, conversations with AT&T, and I think we've got some, we're looking at exploring exactly how we can increase that capacity very rapidly. Okay. So there's no action we need to take today to support that? Uh, let me let me ask one question and, and get everybody's feelings about this. We, you know, we mentioned 24-7. Uh, let's, let's think about, you know, if it wasn't 24-7, but if it was 6 to 10, you know, 6 a.m. in the morning till 10 p.m. at night, there may be certain things that we need to have 24-7. There may be other things that we can say, hey, look, <coughs> we, we, you know, we'll have a couple of people on call if we say go 24-7. But um, what do you all feel about saying if it was 6 to 10 at night, is that enough? Or do you really feel like we need to have the capability of doing it 24-7? What do you think that the, the current volume and, and also as much as you can anticipate what the – Anticipate right. volume. So in the middle of the night, calls are more from clinicians. Um, so the, the you know the nurse hotline or or like you know we have a call center or a call line available for them to call twenty four seven so they can reach epidemiology for any discussion. So the the honest answer is yes that it's more for clinicians. General public calls during during the day most of the time. Have some people left us messages overnight? Yes, that happens, uh, but it's not a huge surge in the middle of the night that we need to address at this point. And in keeping with, we want to take care of the people who are there. If we can, you know, give them eight or nine hours so they can kind of go home, maybe get a little rest and then get back after it, that, that would be helpful. Six to 10 is an improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Next questions. Um, so this is kind of more general. I'd like to, uh, and for GK, to have some type of, it doesn't need to be super in-depth, I wouldn't think, but some type of understanding of how our declaration or how the uh, COVID-19 is affecting each of our departments uh, and their, how we're conducting business. Because um, depending on decisions that have to be made moving forward, it will be good to kind of have an initial baseline and then this is how it's affected and these are the decisions we need to make. And that's one of the things that we covered or tried to cover in, in the memo sure. and it deals with uh, employee absences mm -hmm. and it, it's kind of a wraparound not just employee absences but we, we talk about the negative call time issue and the impact that it has on on the departments. Mm -hmm. What we're initially asking them to do is on a daily basis tell us how many of your employees are absent and what the what the reason is it sickness or is it child care does it relate to the the, the virus itself um, we're we thought we would expand that and, and believe me we will hear if it if it has an impediment on how they do how they do their business um, how do you want that reported well, we're, going to, we're, we're, we're going to probably put a form together and okay. I'm going to ask that it go to um, to HR. They can be the collector of that information. Okay. That way, that way, Miss Glenn can report it back up to our office. Great. Okay. But we'll we'll probably have to think a little bit about how we might want to expand that to to develop quite you know what type of really significant impact is this going to have on county operations so let me pose a couple of questions because as they're developing that form in my at least and there may be other things if the person is out i would kind of like to know whether they're out because of their having to take care of their children i would like to know if they're out because they're not feeling well um uh, and if they're out you know the schools what i've said to the superintendents is ask your employees if they would be willing to volunteer um, to help uh, so, you know in, in that situation they probably shouldn't be out but in, remember in the schools they've told their teachers to stay at home we're probably not going to be doing that but i would at least like to know whether they're out because of their kids or is, are their kids sick or are they just you know home from school and then are they sick or are they and how are they feeling? There's another thing that you need to know on that form, and that is the status of that employee's leave bank. I think that's, that's a good point. 
And I, I don't know if from that we would like to move into a little bit of a discussion. We have on our agenda today uh, the ability, ability to move our adoption of work from home from April 1st back to March today, March 17th. And we can make it retroactive. I don't know that there's a reason to say we'd make it retroactive beyond or before today. But that's one thing. Uh, the negative comp I think we should discuss at this point in time. And then any other employee related issues, let's get that out there and let's let's have some conversation. Before we get to that, let me amend my discussion about lowering the jail census uh, by getting misdemeanors out. Let's not forget our juvenile detention center and address that population as well. Uh, kids who don't need to be in there should not be in there. We need to figure that out. We'll, we'll bring that point up also because I don't believe, uh, I don't believe Benny was there, Benny and Benny. I know you weren't there. Weren't you, you weren't there at the judges meeting? No, sir. Nor was Benny, I don't believe. If I had a, if I had, had a contact journal at that point in time, I'd know. Okay. Go ahead, sir. So what I thought we'd do is continue the discussion. So what I'd like to do is, is take the memo that I sent out to the departments, and there needs to be any clarification, well, then, then we'll do that. And on some of these, we'll, after we go through these, we'll go ahead and, and take some type of formal action. Um, of course, you all received this the same as all the other elected officials and department heads yesterday afternoon. So the first item we talked about was the telecommuting policy. And we said we were going to ask the commissioner's court to, to move the start date of that policy up to March 17th, which is today, rather than April 1st. So we're also, and we're also we're going to request that the, the court uh, authorize the county administrator to be, to be temporarily, temporarily authorized to waive who can participate in telecommuting. I move adoption of that suggested amendment. Second before you start asking your questions. <laughs> and that, and that, that is on the second. agenda for action, so. So I'm not sure what I'm missing here on the second part. That would, I mean, I read the policy, but would waive, <clears throat> tell me again. Okay, so, so here's the deal. The policy itself uh, is, um, is applicable to, to exempt employees. Sure. Okay. And so there may be situations where we have non-exempt employees that uh, that can qualify for working at home or telecommuting. And so the the oh, it's been a long day. The the policy itself. Thank you, Judge, for laughing. Well, uh, I mean, I I definitely know what you're talking about. So the policy itself says all of those have to come back to the commissioner's mm -hmm. court. And so what I'm asking for is the authority to temporarily waive that income so we can, if we have people that can work from home, uh, you know, let us handle that as an administrative function rather than, and we'll keep you all briefed on, on that on a weekly basis, but so we don't need to come back and, and, um, and, and do special requests every week. That's what that's for. Very good. Do we you have want to put a time limit on this? Um, well, I tell you what, we're going to ask for the extension of the of the uh, uh, emergency declaration for 90 days. So why don't we just say uh, running in the same time frame as the existence of the emergency declaration? That's a part of my motion. You still second? Did you second? Nobody second. Oh, it. I yeah. thought you did. I'm okay. still waiting on you. No, I'm good. You're second. in second. Second. <laughs> We'll get you. Okay, we have a motion to second. Any further discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, we, we can cannot. I, I apologize for interrupting, but I've seen Mr. Early come in and out of the room a couple of times. Um, you know, I, I don't I wanted him here for the for at least Vinny's part of the discussion, but if we could maybe get him in here to do his briefing and then get him out of here. He just walked out, so he, he's probably going to be on the phone and not be. Well, and I've got questions for him, too, so. We wanted to surprise you, but we also wanted to get you out of here. 
Because I figured you were on another call, and there's several. If you're like the rest of us, there's probably four or five calls that we've missed. So give us your update, and then we'll let you get out of here. It, it, certainly. Um, one, I want to thank um, Vinny. I want to thank Public Health. I want to thank Mr. Manius. I want to thank you all. I couldn't reiterate stronger the words that Vinny communicated, that this is a community effort. And it doesn't have answers. And those that want immediate answers are being unrealistic. So what we try to do at JPS is just what the county is trying to do, is balance between the reality and the fear in trying to deal with that. The one thing that's interesting about JPS is we walk in the footsteps of history. If you look back at the 40s and the 50s with polio, and you look at other issues with H1N1 recently, and you look at Ebola, JPS has always been there. We've been there for 115 years, and we'll be there for the next 115 and the next 300 after that. So we deal with these kind of situations. Um, I would encourage you all, as Vinny said, um, not to lose your intellect, not to lose your humor, and not to lose the art of exercise and taking care of yourself during this. It's really important to realize that life goes on. And to that extent, life goes on at JPS. Traumas keep happening, strokes keep happening, heart attacks keep happening. I'm asked daily, what's your census? Our census is about the same. And we're usually 87 to 92% capacity on any given day. So our emergency room looks like what our emergency room has looked like. Um, we do see some spikes. And I want to thank Vinny because, and you all, because getting the message out to go to whatever facility you can rather than any emergency room in town right. is not your wisest bet. Go elsewhere. It's a much better place to be. I also want to strongly commend the health care organizations of Tarrant County because we live in a blessed community where we have people like Baylor and we have THR and we have HCA and we have Methodist Mansfield and we have people that are cooperating. We're trying to have our phone calls and trying to do um, the court taking the lead on trying to put us all together. Um, a lot of those uh, dictates can come from other communities and we do have a specialty here in Tarrant County. So I want to thank those. There is a, a variety of, of um, there seem to be misunderstandings. Uh, nothing has closed at JPS. The only facility is one school-based facility in Crowley, and the Crowley Independent School District asked us if we would not continue that, and we're transferring anybody that would need, want, or inquires about an appointment at JPS's Crowley facility to um, see one of our clinics, and we've provided all that. We're calling our patients and everything else. But our school-based clinics, even though schools are not open, our school-based clinics are still open. All of our clinics are still open because we want to utilize that for any needs that people will have. So for those of you who have any questions or concerns, um, I'm happy to, to answer them. You all may have one or two questions that you did not think to ask Vinny, and I'll defer those to Vinny if you'd like to ask me those. <laughs> so I'll be happy to deal with anything you all have. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Representing JPS and always being available, I, as the rest of the, the members of this court, have been telling people do not go to the emergency room unless you're critically ill. Right. Go to one of the JPS community clinics. And I have posted the list of those online. So I hope that uh, y'all are prepared to receive an influx of people in your community clinics and that they will be given the extraordinary care in those facilities that JPS is known for. Yes, sir. We are, we are as prepared as we can be today and we'll be more prepared tomorrow as we go with each new passing nuance to this. And we'll be as, possibly, as prepared as possible. Thank you. So to add to that question, um, you know, we've heard that you should call ahead, not necessarily director from JPS, but you should call ahead to let, uh, if someone thinks that they have COVID-19, that they should call ahead and to, to prep, you know, whatever clinic or whatever facility that they're going to. What would be your recommendation for someone who is coming to JPS clinic um, with the thought that perhaps that they have COVID-19? Well, the first, the first thing we would do is the same thing the county and everybody else is doing is go through that screening process. We've had quite a few folks um, who are concerned and nervous. We, 
we have 6,700 employees that need to come into work every day. We're not an organization that can say, go ahead and work from home. We are um, a challenge with just our own employee base. But I know that there is a concern. So we would go through that screening process. To Vinny's point, we'd ask questions about travel. We'd ask questions about symptoms, those type of things. We have seen a growing number of people who don't fit any of those categories who want to come in and get tested. And that's not the, the proper place. So we're working on, um, to the judge's point, trying to establish a, a call-in situation where people would have that unity of the county. We're trying to work really hard on that. Because it's hard not to give disparate information in different places. So if we can have it in one site, I think that will help people a lot. We're going to work towards that with our colleagues in the industry. That will be very helpful to have a unified voice. But we'll work with people, and we have. Uh, Commissioner, we've done, I think, a, a good job of sort of helping people de-escalate some of their fears and then respecting some of their concerns by having them come in, talk to a primary care doctor. If they call in advance, it's a huge help. Um, particularly to us, and to Commissioner Brooks and the efforts that you're doing in, in your um, district as well to get them to the clinics has been a huge help for us. And that I would continue to emphasize. Okay. Um, so then are we tracking specifically people who come to JPS clinics and say, I think I have coronavirus and I'd like to be tested? Not necessarily tracking um, that we do keep because it, it, those would be very large, well, I shouldn't say very large numbers. Those would be a lot of people misunderstanding what the situation is. Sure. So we try to keep um, track of everybody that comes in and what their issues are. Of course. But again, we're still in flu season, and we're still in a, a, a regular type situation where we're trying to administer. But everybody that comes in and says, I want to be tested, we don't necessarily track. But We've had a great working relationship with, with public health, and we continue to have that. Everything that has come through us has gone through public health. Uh, and then moving on specifically to the hospital, if you'll just speak to our capabilities and resources to handle critically ill or those who may come in with you know, acute respiratory illnesses. Sure. Um, again, we're handling things on a daily basis as we've had. We're not at a crisis point where we're asking people um, we can't come here. We are restricting visitors. We are putting up policies in place that are very um, common with other healthcare organizations. We're asking people that they not um, bring three to four or five people. We're asking them just to bring one, less in the case of it's um, our labor and delivery. Well, we were allowed for two, obviously. Um, but we're trying to restrict. We're trying to uh, restrict access into the facility as well. Uh, and we're providing screenings for all that are coming into the facility so that we can get a better handle on folks. Our board meeting last week, that's why I don't have an update on the board meeting, we did cancel the board meeting. It wasn't necessarily because of, of board members. It was because we were inviting quite a few people into the hospital, and we had no idea how many public members would like to be there. We're not going to cancel all meetings in the future, obviously. We have work to be done, but we may want to think of alternative situations for those where people aren't coming up to the third floor of the hospital and commandeering um, through, through the halls. So other than that, it's regular operations at, at JPS. And again, this is not our first time to deal with an issue where we don't have answers, um, particularly when we dealt with it recently with Ebola and, and trying to deal with that issue. So we are prepared with um, personal protection equipment. We are prepared with as much equipment as we can possibly get. We've had a challenge uh, with getting um, sort of the, the, the quick read thermometers. Uh, there's been a run on that. Some of the PPE equipment does come out of Italy. Um, didn't realize that until we found <laughs> out uh, that some of that comes from some of the more in, um, highly infected areas uh, of, the, of the world. So that's a bit of a challenge, but we're all in that same challenge. And again, I think to keep your intellect, to keep your calm, and, and to keep understanding that business needs to continue. And that's what we're doing. So my final question is about um, the bond. And I know that we were kind of uh, trying to figure out a date that we would review that uh, the short list of applicants. I don't know if we've had any conversations about what that date is and then how will we, we conduct have, that meeting. We have had discussions. And okay. um, we asked you all to check your calendars. It's the first Monday of April. Okay. I believe that's either the 5th or 6th. 
April 6th, yeah. Okay. Okay. I think we, I, the last that I had heard, we were checking with Commissioner Johnson, so that's been done. Okay. So then I guess we will get a little bit further down the road and figure out how we're actually going to conduct that meeting. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. You bet. I want to personally thank you all. It's not easy to be an elected official during this time because your constituents are going to call with a variety of concerns and they too have fears. Um, but to, to Vinny's point about his employees, you can't find better folks than at JPS and the hours they're putting in and the amount of time they're trying to deal in seeking answers that aren't readily available in trying to do this. I couldn't be more proud. And the other thing at JPS, a lot of people join JPS out of a mission drive. They have it in their heart. I've not heard one employee at JPS say, we're not going to be here for the long haul. They come in. They do everything every day. And I will not miss a beat at any public meeting not to thank the people that I'm lucky enough to work with because they're incredible folks dealing with some things that oftentimes we don't even have to deal with. And I'm really proud of them. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Appreciate you very much. You betcha. Okay, so if we could just a few more comments on the telecommuting policy itself. Um, we've asked the departments to identify people that might have the ability because of their job descriptions to work from home and also to ask them what type of equipment that they may need to uh, if in fact they work from home. Uh, we had a meeting with IT and um, you know I was I I was somewhat surprised and very pleasingly surprised that um, we currently have 1,331 laptops that are county owned that we can put a VPN, pro a VPN process on those. So, so when you think about if we have a little over 4,000 employees and a lot of those employees have to work at the county rather than from home like the jail operations and, and things such as um, as motor vehicle, we're getting closer to to may not having to need a whole bunch more equipment. However, we do have approximately 100 uh, laptops now that uh, that are not part of that 1,331 that we are programming so that we'll have the equipment. Plus, we have placed an order of 50 additional laptops so that we have the adequate equipment. We don't know how long this is going to last, but. Uh, but we, we, if we can have the opportunity and the equipment to send people um, to work from home, then we will, we're going to try to do that. The, um, let, me, let me see what else we have on that. Okay, so that's what we had on that. So when we talk about absentee records, we've already discussed that to a certain extent. And uh, we also talked a little bit about what it's going to take or how we should address uh, those individuals who may not have leave time. I think what I'm going to suggest, rather than ask the court to take any action on that today, I want to take that back down in HR to develop a policy which we'll bring back um, uh, next week uh, to make sure that we have the proper terminology that we think this thing through, and we'll have that back on the agenda for your action next week. And the only thing I would, I mean, and, and you all will tell me if you disagree, but people are may be experiencing, okay, can I take off right now? I don't have any leave. I fully hope that as a court, we can develop a policy that we'll feel comfortable with that at a minimum will give us the ability to have a negative comp time. Absolutely. That, that someone, you know, will be able to, to take it and then as they accrue vacation into the future, that they'll first off wipe out the negative comp time and We'll, we'll do now. We're not saying we're giving money away, but uh, we're going mean, to want and, us to be good on yeah, that. Not at all. We're being compassionate with our employees. We make a lot of statements about how we're family, and uh, we need to act like family in times of crisis and take care of each other. I think we've got some situations right now that we need to probably address with some employees. That right now, this week, with school being out, um, you know, I think we've got 
that situation. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that that policy is backdated. It's so retroactive. Retroactive. So it'll cover those employees. So what I'm, I understand that that, you know, we're saying we don't know what the policy is, but I guess, and you know, and this, this may be pushing more than what legally we can do without having that there, but I, what I would just simply say is we're going to create a policy that will give those people who are off or have to be off without mm -hmm. uh, leave at this point in time, you know, we're going to give them options which will yeah. uh, allow them not to be without the funds. I had one yesterday, one of my people yesterday, who was off without the benefit of leave time. It, we'll make it retro. We'll make it retroactive. We'll just make it work. We'll yeah. make it work. Okay, and uh, we already talked about the meeting attendance rolls, the logs, and so we'll make sure that uh, that we get another memorandum out to uh, to the department heads and elected officials, um, basically uh, talking about what we what we've discussed today. So, as you can tell, and with one of the comments we had at the beginning of this was courtroom attendance and presentations. We're going to continue to encourage uh, people, if they don't have business, uh, our employees and department heads, if they, if they don't have any direct uh, business with the commissioner's court during our meetings, well, then we're going to ask that they, they not come in. They can watch it on, on video. Uh, we live stream this. Um, as you see in the, in the memo itself, we uh, We've also said that, you know, as far as the, uh, the um, distancing between people, the six feet apart, I think as we go through all of our meetings, it's going to be important that if we have these meetings held here, then we need to make sure we have adequate space so that we can try to get six feet between people. We are going to continue to uh, live stream out of 504, and that will hold a certain number of people also. We've asked uh, department heads and elected officials if they would like for our department to make their presentation for them. If it appears to be non-controversial, well, then we'll be more than happy to do that. Um, and uh, then let's see. And then some other issues before we go into some court actions. Just want to, and we talked a little bit about this, but just for the court's information, most non-essential county meetings have been canceled or rescheduled. And at the staff level, if, if we don't have to have meetings, well, then we're not going to have meetings. If we have to have meetings, we're going to do the go-to meeting aspect. It works really well. We use it quite a bit. We held our department head meeting yesterday morning on a go-to meeting, and it worked out just fine. Um, we also need to talk about employee recognition so if you want to make an announcement now we're going to postpone the April's April's at a minimum and we may we'll address May as we get closer to that uh, that just means I'll get to make a whole lot more calls for our May one of course our May one is normally our employee appreciation that we do outside but we're we've already you know I think we had already decided and I hope everybody agrees that we're just going to cancel one for April yeah, and, and as we get closer to May, we're going to talk about it. We really want to have that outside. But those type of things we're going to need to have a weekly discussion on. Um, the March 31st meeting of the Commissioner's Court, that's the fifth meeting of the month, and we're recommending that we do not have court that day. Fine. It's, I, think it's, I think it's a good idea. Okay. Also, and you noticed, I noticed today on the agenda because when I came in, I was going to pull it, but there was not a need to out-of-state travel. Uh, we're going to ask the departments that, if at all possible, if you don't have to do out-of-state travel, then then let's let's not let's not do it until we feel comfortable traveling again. And I probably make that a, a, a very very strong recommendation. And I'm not sure that we may not come back very quickly and say we really don't want you traveling to meetings out of the yeah. out of the county. Yeah. We have the direct authority because you have to get commissioner's court prior approval for out of state, but we can also send some directives down and we'll do that. But just want to make sure that you all are aware of that. And would you also go back and maybe have someone from your office go back and look at what we have approved 
we're already doing that. Yeah, they're coming up and, yeah. and again, discourage that. Yes. One other thing while you're talking about that, you know, you I want to go back a little bit to your commuting. You know, one of the things that I think you said we have how many laptops right now? Uh, we have uh, 1,331 of our employees have laptops as their primary device. And I, th I think in the future as we go forward and look at refreshing computers and doing things, I'm not altogether sure we shouldn't get away from actually having desktops and maybe everybody have laptops. With a docking station. That'd be, yeah, so whatever. I mean, let's explore that as you start through your budget and as you start your conversations with IT uh, because I think uh, in some instances they're, they may be less uh, or very similar to the same price and in this way if this happens again we'll be better we'll, we'll work with IT and with budget on those issues and, and see if we can address it that way. Um, passport operations. Passport operations. The county clerk's office has canceled uh, passport operations for the next two weeks. Just this week? I'm pretty sure we're closed. Okay. We're not going to open next week. Okay. So are you ready to make that announcement about next week? Or? We need to get with the federal. That's, that's, the that's, that's correct. So okay. Okay. So there was an error on, on this. We said two weeks. It's this week, and, and the county clerk is going to uh, ask uh, the Department of State about next week. The jury services have limited their activities. Uh, the um, there will be no new juries called until at least April 20th and I know that some people were in had called our office about that and probably some of your offices also we're recommending if you have any additional questions as it relates to jury services to call uh, Paul Morales Miss Morales is the jury bailiff and she'll be able to handle those questions um, the district, county, and JP courts have also limited uh, jury trials through April 20th. And so, and so we've asked that if anyone has any questions about that, that they should reach out to those respective uh, uh, courts for information. And then finally, what we also are going to do, and we have done this, we have closed the county fitness facilities so that until we get uh, a better ho handle on uh, on the uh, coronavirus. So those are the things that uh, we communicated to the department heads and elected officials yesterday. I would ask you, is there anything else the court would like us to communicate? We, we, we tried to capture everything that we knew at yesterday, but if you have any additional information you would like for us to distribute, in these memos, if you'll just simply contact our office, Megan South is running point on this for us. I have two questions. One related to our budget meetings. Don't those, the department by department budget meetings, don't those usually start in April? I believe they start in May. May, okay. Okay, thanks for the reminder. Okay. Um, and then for facilities, um, David had sent out a really thorough email about the measures that we were taking to sanitize yes. our county buildings. If I remember correctly, and I didn't check this, um, so you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I know that there were, I guess, still some uh, needs for like hand sanitizer pumps and then also um, foot pulls for the doors. And then also, I know that we've put out some signage, like if you have these symptoms, stop and call the coronavirus hotline. Um, I don't, just based off a couple buildings that I've been in recently, I don't know that the signage is placed as well as it could be it seems like it's more faced towards internal people and not necessarily the public which we needed to serve everybody sure. um, so I can give you those specific examples but I think just an update on how things are going with, with facilities and sure yeah, that the, would as far as the signage is concerned we're also having that uh, translated into Spanish and Vietnamese okay. so we'll have we'll have those that type of signage there also Do you have an idea of when that that, that the trilingual oh uh, I know they're working on I don't I don't know if it's at it's probably at the print shop now getting the signs made but of course we're trying to move as quickly as possible as far as the hand sanitizers and everything my conversations with mr. Phillips is that we've got a lot of this stuff on back order mm -hmm. and we and the rest of the world are all trying to order cases of this stuff right. so we're trying to get it as quickly as possible sure. 
Uh, we are, I don't know if you've noticed it, um, uh, you'll see more of janitorial services uh, out and about cleaning. We've, we've already begun that and, and putting more people in the buildings, cleaning not just once a day, but several, day, several times a day, that type of deal. One of the things that, um, that Ms. Nicholson actually brought to our attention, which is a, something we need to explore, is that I was down at, um, at the Emergency Operations Center yesterday with the City of Fort Worth. Judge, you were there also. Um, they took temperatures of people that were coming in and we may very well want to look at some type of temperature uh, guns that we can issue to departments so that they can take the temperatures of individuals that work in in that department. Mm -hmm. We, uh, I know our department, uh, Mr. Singleton, actually went out and acquired one, and we take everybody's temperature in the morning. Mine has been running around 93, or 93 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so I don't, I don't know what that means. Back on the issue of sanitizing yes, sir. buildings, the uh, Miller Avenue Government Center is in three separate buildings. Okay. And they only have one person. I'll get with Mr. Phillips on that. To cover those three buildings, and it's not be being adequately done because it's too much for one person to do as often as we need it done. That's under a contract with an outside vendor and we need to figure out how to ramp that up so that we can get better coverage at that facility. Okay. I know that uh, Mr. Phillips was dealing with a bunch of that and I'll, I'll make sure we pass that note off to him. Okay, that's so we could now go back to the agenda and ask you to actually uh, take some action. If we can go to the county administrator section on item number A1, we're requesting that the commissioner's court ratify and extend for 90 days the declaration of local disaster, which was issued by Judge Whitley on March 13, 2020. Now, I want to be sure, because I thought we had already done that particular item. No, we remember we withdrew the motion <coughs> until we could... Uh, okay, you're right. You're right. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Yes. So, um, it's for a 90-day extension. How do we come to the 90-day number? Normally, we've used 90 days when we do burn bans. Okay. And that, you know, that is just a... That, that's just a standard deal. It doesn't have to be, you know. The one thing that we did put into um, into this uh, order was that, and I'll read it. That was why we had to do an amended deal. On item number three, we said this renewal of declaration of local disaster affirms the activation of the Tarrant County Emergency Management Plan and extends the declaration of local disaster for a period of 90 days, unless rescinded by an order of the commissioner's court. So we can come back any time. If we need to pull that to a shorter period of time, we can simply bring it back to court. Okay. And then, um, I mean, I'm fine with it. I just, I didn't know why. Um, so Dallas County in particular in their resolution, and I know obviously each county is different, but I was just curious. They specifically had a section related to um, the reporting of let's see city managers that it's it's reporting of all public private and commercial labs within the city of grand prairie actually this is the city of grand prairies shall report the number of COVID 19 tests and i know there's a difference between counties and cities i don't know why they would specify that we don't have that specified in our resolution is it just a matter of semantics well i, well, I don't even want to go let me ask, let me ask a question and, and maybe provide a little bit of an answer okay um, I, there are differences. We have several cities who have adopted our uh, emergency operations plans. We have several other cities who have their own. Um, I would like to ask uh, the DA as well as uh, Mr. Maney, your, your staff, to go over our emergency uh, operation plan and that if we need to make changes, 
then let's try to identify what changes we think need to be made. Let's, if it requires a public hearing before we can do that, let's, let's see if we can't set the public hearing for next Tuesday. And hopefully if we have the public hearing, we can take action on the same day. But that guideline is set. And so we'll, we'll follow that, but let's move as quickly as possible to identifying what changes we feel like need to be made and, uh, and giving us a, a draft of those changes so that we can implement that as quickly as possible. Um, and it, it may be a week, it may be a couple of weeks, whatever the law says we have to do in order to be able to amend the plan. Yeah, we, have, we have already started to do that. Uh, Mr. McCurdy, our emergency management uh, director, is going through that. We'll make sure we get with the DA's office so that we can collaborate on that particular issue. Okay. That was, okay. Did one of my questions. Uh, any other discussion? No. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, so this item number two We've been working with purchasing departments, and and let me tell you the reason that we have this. And what this is, we're going to request that the commissioner's court approve an exemption from competitive bidding requirements for the purchases related to COVID-19 de declaration of, of local disaster. I know that we're working with the district attorney's office, and 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 this may be a belts and suspenders issue, but um, but. This whole, this whole time that we've been dealing with, with COVID-19, we've had to make some really quick decisions and we've had to go out and, and do some rentals. We had, to, we had to do some purchasing. Dr. Tanasia talked about the fact that we turned around a $100,000 purchase in a matter of two days. First, let me say that Jack Beecham and the purchasing department have, have been stellar on this. They have been true partners with us. And Jack, we appreciate what you're doing. So what this is, though, is that because there's things that simply come up and we need to move quickly, that we want to make sure that the commissioner's court understands that uh, that we would seek things where we wouldn't be we wouldn't want to put an RFP or a bid document on the street because we don't need it in two months. We need it in, in two hours, and so that's what this particular item deals with. And uh, the commissioner's court does have the authority to exempt certain purchases from uh, the, the competitive bidding requirements. And so we would like a, gen, a general order from the court that recognizes that we are going to have to maybe do this and to authorize these acquisitions. That only makes sense. We're in a state of emergency. I move approval. Second. A motion to second. And I would just. We think this is belt and suspenders. Um, we've heard from the DA uh, this morning, and, I, and I'm going to tell you we're going to try to set up a, a process and stay within the open meetings rules uh, that we notify you of things that we're doing. Um, I, had, I did ask the DA to check on that, and uh, she basically said that once we went to the state of emergency that the purchasing agent and I can basically make any purchases or uh, execute any contracts that we want to for as long as we're in that state of disaster, state of an emergency. But what we'll say is, is that if we do something like that, um, we'll get the word out to you all that we've, that we've done that. And we'll simply bring it back to court the next week or two, just to, just not for approval, but for a receive and file or something like that, okay. if that's okay sure. with you. Okay, so in reading the communique, <clears throat> In background, the second paragraph says currently the county does not have a contract in place to, and it goes on. And then later, the last paragraph, still under background, says therefore it's a recommendation that the commissioner's court approve an exemption from competitive bidding requirements for purchases. So, it, this sounds like two different things to me. Well, yeah. what we tried to Unless do. I'm not so we, we worked with the district attorney's office to get the language as it relates to, to um, well, let's see here community awareness and preparedness, okay? So we're not talking about a specific contract in here? No. We're just talking, okay. No, we're it just trying to use some general language that uh, is broad enough to cover those areas that we think are, that we think we're going to have to acquire. Sure. So that's what that is, Commissioner. Again, and, and, uh, I think when we wrote this and we put this in there, we really hadn't 
fully looked at the legal, what authority we had, mm -hmm. uh, and since that time, we've basically had, yeah. you know, an agreement. DA's looked at it. I think we talked with Jack about it. Basically, we have the authority to do that. This is just, again, letting you all kind of understand that, and again, we, we want to do as much as we can, but it does not require the Commissioner's Court approval in order for us to be able to do this. No further discussion. Uh, okay. Motion second. Yeah. Okay. Motion second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. I think that that is some of the specifics that uh, we wanted to talk about as related to COVID-19. Do uh, Doctor, do you have anything else you want to talk? No, sir, we're good. Okay. Thank you. Correct. I have more questions. Um, specifically related to our communication capabilities um, and how, what are our capabilities to provide updates to our residents, um, especially for those who aren't necessarily digi digitally connected. I know we have the coronavirus hotline, but we push people to the website and not everyone, you know, there's a digital divide and I understand that some of the service providers are providing services to those who otherwise perhaps couldn't afford it. I don't know all the details of that, but do we have a robocall system or reverse 911 or something? What are all the, the means through which we are currently utilizing or plan to utilize to reach Commissioner, you had brought that issue up uh, the other day, right. you and I, when you and I had talked about the reverse 911. And I apologize, we still, uh, let me do, I'll get, I'll make sure we can put a note on that. Okay get back. I think it's an excellent idea to get information out to our citizens. I don't know if our reverse 911 deals solely with the unincorporated areas or we can expand that. Sure. But then just what's our larger communication capabilities and plan and is that would it would that lend to contracting with someone to, to do it. I mean, there's there's a lot to communicate internally, a lot to communicate externally, so. So how we've been communicating is is in several ways. First of all, we, uh, we have a much more active social media uh, place. And so we're doing a lot of uh, Facebooks, Twitter, that type of deal. Our so digital media manager is, is active in that along with our PIO. We're trying to get, we're also doing news releases to the newspaper and they've been fairly good in contacting or at least uh, placing those, those uh, that information in the newspaper. I know that we've also have invited the media to listen in on, on our <coughs> telephone calls that, for two reasons. We want to make sure that we're transparent and also to get the word out. And I, I know I look at the newspaper every morning, and it's there's a lot in there, and so we're communicating that way. Uh, we're putting other stuff up on our website. You know, you're not going to see the same things that you see on Facebook or our social media as you see on our website. You may see some, but we try to target different audiences, and the message may be fairly short, on, especially on social media. Our, our new, like I said, our new social media manager, she is, she's really good, and uh, she's helping us craft those messages so that it has a maximum impact. No, it's part of why I'm saying it, because oh, are, they're, no, they're, you're, they're, you're, you're I'm, I'm right in the now. middle. I'm right in the middle, so I try to claim the best of both generational uh, sectors there. Yeah, the social media but issues, there have, is an there's like 30, 30 to 45 second type thing. Sure. But I, I'm just saying that based off of what I've heard and what I've observed, uh, not everyone reads the paper. They, they probably should, but not everyone does. So I just want to make sure that we're thinking about all the ways that we sure. should be communicating with people and are we doing enough? And if we're not, what resource do, do we need to ensure that? This is not a criticism of any particular sure. staff or what we've done so far, but the public has a very valid expectation that they will hear from respected reliable sources so yes we can say here it is but we also but that's just part of outreach 101 is meeting people where they are um, and I am concerned about people who don't have digital access um, and just perhaps like we did with the census where we have snail mail measures in place to reach folks 
have we evaluated doing something similar, even if it's to direct people to a telephone number or to a website? Like, we just, we got to do more. Okay. I think with regard, I agree with what you're saying. We can explore. I want to explore the reverse 911. Um, I think we will depend upon our media to put out the information regarding our hotlines. And uh, again, as I've said earlier and, and will continue to say, if, if you have statements, if we have things that we feel like need to be put out there, let's get them to, you know, our uh, public information officer, let's get them to, to Bill Hanna and let him figure out, but we're going to try to post everything in one place. I understand that's still digital. <laughs> Um, but if we're going to do it through a hotline, then that's where we, in addition to putting it all over the social media that we have, that's where we're going to go to the TV stations and everybody else and say, please advertise, put a trailer, do, do whatever we need to do to say, if you've got questions, here's where you call. Sure. So I think what we might do, let us, uh, and we raise a good point because it's, it's communicate, communicate, communicate. We've always talked about that. So let us go ahead and come back to you all next week with a specific report. You might want to and tell you how we, what we are doing, but you all might also think about other ways. And uh, we'll try to get, obviously it'll be in your court packet by this Friday, but if you have other ways, please let us know. And we'll see if we can, can develop it. The 911, the reverse 911 was something we hadn't thought of. And so it's a, it's a great idea. Do you have somebody that Mike can do um, either daily or on a regular schedule to our employees? <clears throat> you know, what is happening and what is going on? Yeah. We had what calls are going to be taking place? Yeah. I'm getting inundated with businesses, churches, Cities, you know, win winter calls, and I know that you know we we we've had a number of them, and, and I know y'all notify a lot of people, but I'm not sure we're getting so, everybody. And I, I know that we have a communication system at our office through email and e blast with probably five six thousand people, um, maybe more. And so it's, you know, we can put out that information. So what we were going to do, we, we were going to start it last week and then yesterday, but we were pretty much consumed yesterday. <clears throat> but our goal is to either on a daily or other, every other day mm -hmm. give you all a one or two sheet document that basically says an update on everything that we know. Um, if, if you see that, we'll try to get one out by by tomorrow or, or Thursday. Uh, if you see that as something that you would like to send out to department heads, elected officials, or just to the ZZ Top box, you know, that uh, that's all employees, we'll be more than happy to do that also. I want you all yeah, to take a look. That's not the group. It's not the ZZ Top group. It's <laughs> our, our own little email. <laughs> Robert said we got to keep the humor in this thing, so, you know, yes, we're going to keep a little bit of humor in this deal. Just a little bit, right? That's right. Just a very little bit. <laughs> so, so we were going to do that anyway because, because we get we get really consumed with this, and sometimes we think everybody knows what we know. And we find we out don't. that very few people know that. So, to that end, uh, what I would add is we've asked Vinny to begin Vinny and others to begin a daily, very short uh, message. That kind of says, here's where we are, here's the thing that we want to talk about today. I know, again, that's digital, so what we will explore, we have been having a 10 o'clock call every day that was, or on Mondays, that was just opened up and anybody could call in that wanted to. I think our limit as far as numbers uh, of people who could participate in that was approximately 2,500, but what we might do is explore with some of our communication companies the ability to really throw that wide open, make it a listen only deal, not where we're gonna get in and start getting a bunch of questions, but just listen only and do that maybe on a daily basis. So I think that's a great idea, a great point. And I think what we need to do is just explore the possibilities and again, do that and try to have an answer for it. 
to everybody very quickly. Yeah, let's let we'll we'll I think that's a great idea. A lot of the information that we were going to put on that one sheeter, if you will, would be more internal facing, but we can add to that also so that it can be external facing. Well, I think maybe the important takeaway here is that we've talked about a number of things today that we're going to implement, work on, try to get ready. Somebody probably ought to sit down and look at this video and figure out everything we've just committed and staff has committed right. to do. Believe so me. that we don't we're let any do things, you know, drop through the, the cracks and... Um, I think it would be good if we had that list of here's what we're going to implement and here's when we think we can. Okay. Can I, can I, I want to, I think that's a great idea. We're going to delegate. So could you or someone on your staff actually go, I mean, because I can tell you GK is going to be on five little conference calls mm -hmm. and most of his staff is going to be there. So if you or your staff, one of your staff, folks could go through there and make that list, that would be great. We could probably help do that. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Thank you. Um, Your Honor, the two presentations, one dealing with 911, the other about the unincorporated areas for development, we have postponed those, so we are ready to go into closed session. Okay. Uh, any comments, any other comments from us? up here before we do that. Okay, in, in closing, I'm gonna go over just two or three things very quickly. Um, one, again, it's St. Patrick's Day. Celebrate by staying home. Um, we've talked about social distancing several times, six feet, try to practice it, try to encourage everybody to practice it. Um, one of the things that we haven't talked about is if you see folks or you go into businesses or anything else where people are price gouging or trying to run any kind of a scam, take pictures. Um, I know that the AG is the one that's responsible for doing that, but I'm sure they're going to depend very heavily on our uh, DA's office to help maybe in the in the beginning of that process. And I hope that we'll go after them with everything we've got. Uh, this is not a time for anybody to take advantage. I, I'm not even gonna tell you what radio station I heard on, but I was coming in the other day and somebody was advertising that it wasn't too late, they could get seeds and they could start growing their own food and that they were sure this was gonna last for, for months and they needed to get the seeds now. And I'm thinking, okay, that, that may not be price gouging, but that's coming in my mind real close to being a scam. It's fear mongering. That's right. So if you, if you hear that, if you see that, make a record of it. Um, we may very quickly decide, no, there's nothing we can do about that, but I'm going to do everything we can to go after those folks um, and put them in as dark a hole as I can find to put them in. With that, we're going to recess our open meeting, proceed to closed, to discuss items exempted under Section 551.071. Trophy Club. Trophy Club's got a bunch of help. <laughs> Having returned from our closed session, we'll now address the following matters. Okay. <coughs> Ange? Good job. We are requesting approval for changes to the table of organizations. I don't want to touch that. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> Four, I've lost my train of thought now. The 200, I, and, I know, us. right? The 233rd District Court and the 323rd District Court 
We are requesting the transfer of a court coordinator position from the 323rd to the 233rd, as well as a reclassification of the an assistant court coordinator position in the 323rd. This would be effective, the transfer effective the 18th of March, the reclassification effective April 4th. The cost of the general fund would be approximately $11,600. Move Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we have this time. And there being no further business, we are adjourned. Thank you.